And now your host, Joe Ganzis. Hey guys, what's going on? And welcome back to Around the Kits video live stream show. Today, Sunday, October 9th, 2022. I'm your host, Joe Ganzis, and for the next two hours, we'll be talking drums, 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 and if that's not enough, drum some more. Guys, we have another tremendous show tonight. Our main guests tonight, two of the best in the world of drumming, at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the living legend, Phil Ehart. In the 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time slot, Mark Zonder. Two great world-class drummers who happen to be really close friends. Um, I hope to get so much out of them. Mark has been on the show several times. This is the first time for Phil, so we're looking forward to it. And when you say Phil Ehart and Kansas, wow, that whole catalog is just epic. And Mark Zonder is a legend in the world of metal from Fate's Warning to everything he's doing to his brand new band, A to Z. We'll talk about that and everything else. We're introducing today a brand new segment. Today's show will have no round table, but a brand new segment called Host vs. Producer. The host, meaning me, Joe Gansis, will bring up a topic with our great producer slash director, John Besser, and we'll talk about this. It could be anything from drums to anything musically to bands, but it'll be definitely something music related as far as the topic. So these types of, you know, talks and segments, John has no idea what I'm going to be bringing up. So it's a cool little, um, you know, not a round table. It's just a discussion. Me and John, we're looking forward to that. And... Our last show was a big success with the new aspect, thanks to John's lovely wife, Rayanne, who I wish would keep her mouth shut. Rayanne, shh, be quiet with the ideas. God damn, give me a headache. No, she's great, Rayanne, uh, John's beautiful wife. Her idea to bring, uh, you know, all aspects around the kit, which we love. Um, so last show we had the living legend, Billy Sheehan, a world-class bassist. We have some great guitarists coming up, producers, engineers, famous DJs. So we got a lot of different aspects going on around the kit. So we love when Rayanne opens her mouth. Not really. <laughs> Just kidding. We love Rayanne. We got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, we have one more show coming up after this. And then our producer, John, will be on tour with his band, um, he's filling in for a punk band. We wish him all the best. He'll be gone a couple of weeks, end of October, and then I'll be uh, going on a, a big vacation for about 10 days. So we're not going to be doing a show probably the most of the end of October to beginning of November. Probably be back with Around the Kit mid-November. But our next show after this is October 23rd. And the first time on Around the Kit, the legendary Kelly Keegi from Night Ranger and a guest who's been on the show uh, over 30 times, the great Daniel Glass. A lot of stuff coming up. Always appreciate uh, your time. Uh, just have a lot of different uh, things going on as far as the thought process. Myself and John and Rayanne and Rayanne. Just kidding. Uh, we appreciate all the comments and the attention that Around the Kit's been getting. Uh, and we appreciate this time tonight. Hope to have a great show. If we can right now, let's hear from our main sponsor of the show, Senten Symbol. Around the Kit is sponsored by Senten Symbols. Senten Symbols is quickly becoming the choice for drummers worldwide. With their roots going back to the emperors of the Qing Dynasty, Senten blends the best of old world know-how with modern techniques to help all drummers find the best fit for them. Whether you're an avid drumming enthusiast or touring professional, Senten has the perfect combination of products, pricing, and service to fit any drummer's needs. Contact them today to find out what the drum love is really all about. Send 10 symbols. Forge your sound. 
Hey, this is Kenny Aronoff in my studio, Uncommon Studios LA. Check out Joe Gans' podcast, Around the Kit. He's unstoppable. He's undeniable. He's so authentic because he loves drummers. He loves the drumming community. And he has the most amazing people on his podcast. Hey, when I was on, I learned all kinds of stuff about me I didn't know about. Because he asked the right questions. Check it out. Joe Gansis, Around the Kit. Hey, guys, what's going on? Joe Gansis here along with John Besson. What's up, Johnny? What's up, Joe? What's up, everybody? How you doing today, bro? Keeping it real. You know how we Good. do. Java. Ah, we are back today with these little reaction videos. We're talking about anything musical, but you never know. One day we'll go off topic and hopefully um, doesn't get too crazy. But music bands, uh, musicians, and albums, and where they were in certain genres. Today we're talking about a very monumental album in the world of music. And uh, we go back to 1978, and this band from Van Halen comes out. This band from California, sorry, comes out called Van Halen and just has this debut album um, where the first thing we hear is, I think, a car horn with Running With The Devil and then just hear that bass, boom, boom, and just everything comes in. There's even piano in that song, people don't know. Right. But um, yeah, uh, Van Halen won, John. Um, I was nine years old. I think you were eight years old. I don't remember the album because I wasn't into music yet, but later on... Uh, Van Halen won. Um, my brother had a band, and they did You Really Got Me. I didn't know it was um, Kinks. I just thought it was some band that sound, and, and so I, that's my first introduction was probably about 78, 79. But it was just another thing. I, I was more into what I was into, whatever, but still. But I was very familiar with that. Then I heard Eruption, and, and you know, now it's, it's totally cliched, like, you know what it is or whatever, but imagine all the way back then, the sounds coming out of a guitar and this guy who's just killing it. So I, I would say I probably heard it maybe 78, 79, I'm sorry, 79, 80 maybe. And uh, of course, blown away. I'd say probably closer to 80 because, you know, at that time there was a lot. I mean, 1980 was some year for music, uh, for great bands. But Van Halen comes out. Um, you're right about the horn. Um, I think that's Alex's horn or something like that, the way they did it. I, I, I love, uh, I'm a recording engineer. I love all that stuff, an audio file. So I love that I researched that record and, and stories they talk about it where uh, the drums were recorded with like um, 57s and 58s on the bass drum. <clears throat> One of the songs, the bass drum mics were off. And, and they, did we get the guitar? And they're like, yeah, like, who cares? We're good. We'll just use the room mic. So, I mean, like, it was really all about Eddie, but still. What what an amazing album! I've I've heard the the vocals, uh, David Lee Roth's uh, uh, vocals to Running with the Devil, like isolated. It's it's like we like we've said before. It's magic. It's stuff that you cannot, you know. You, I can't do it. You can't do it. Right. Nobody can do it. But he did it. You know. What I mean, like it's just it's a moment in time that's amazing. We always think about, um, and we can't include. Um, uh, uh, Ozzy's Blizzard of Oz, because he was in a band already. Mm -hmm. But we think about albums that uh, still, you know, we think about a band, we always say, what's a band's, what's the best be, uh, first album for a band? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard to argue with that one. That's that's a tough one. I don't care what album sold more or whatever. You, if you want to say, you want to claim that you've got the best debut album, yeah, well, Put it up against that one. I mean, yeah. before that, I mean, Boston put out a great record, and we should probably do one on that too. But Boston's first record was was at the time, you know, the the <laughs> was like kind of like the bar as like no one else did that, you know, not on their debut album. Yeah, and that was then, yeah, 76. Oh, yeah, yeah, 76. Yeah, but I'm saying, but like, there's that bar that no no one's gonna beat that. And then an album like Van Halen one comes out and. You can argue all you want. It's two different styles of music, more or less. You know, I mean, Tom Schultz is no Eddie Van Halen, and, and Eddie Van Halen is no Tom Schultz. And I'm sure that and I'm sure Eddie, oop, I'm sure Eddie um, admired Tom Schultz. Um, but and then, you know, they're both innovators. That's pretty funny too. That those two guys were both beyond, you know, beyond the guitar, uh, guitar playing. But but that album is so powerful, and you know, it it worked its way up. They they went out on tour with Sabbath. 
Um, I mean, I, I, I've read a lot into uh, like Van Halen's beginnings because they're an amazing band. I've never, they've never been my favorite band, but some of their songs are some of my favorite songs. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and, and definitely Eddie's my favorite guitar player, period, hands down. My brother-in-law, Tony Gunn, who was in a band with you, a great guitarist. Tony he, Gunn, oh yeah. He's seen that tour. Oh, uh, he's seen Van Halen. He open. been blown away. I guess in New York for the Sabbath, I guess. Yeah, he, he said it was awesome. But uh, but to be fair, is that album the same without Eruption? I think I think the songs would probably uh, Eruption didn't come out first, so they 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 um their boost came from covering the Kink song, right? And Which then, is, yeah. is is from Eruption. Eruption goes into that. No, but when it was first played you didn't get okay. a, like the single like what was being played on the radio was not, until finally someone said what's this thing before that and then right. that's when all it all held but i'm saying like my introduction to them was not through eruption my introduction through that and anytime i heard them on the radio it was like you know what right. I mean? so back, we're talking 70s radio like early 80s or whatever um yeah but but then their backup was they just added that little piece into the front of it and it just changed you know Change the guitar world. You know, yeah, I think it's it, and it's still a, you know, is it the greatest guitar solo of all time? I don't even, but I think it's just probably the most popular solo, maybe, and, and, and maybe probably one of the worst, uh, one of the world's most famous ones. And, and you know that the story goes is that he was just noodling around, and uh, Don Landy and um, oh, Jesus, I can't think of the producer. Help me, uh, Ted uh, Templeman. He um, said, hit, "Hit that record button," and recorded that, and like, and played it back to him, saying, you, this is, and "He's like, oh, I was just noodling around," and and it was just fortunate that those guys heard that, and were like, hit that tape button, and there's and there's eruption. I think my brother-in-law Tony Gunn also told me that there's a mistake in that, and they oh. left. Yeah. Oh, there's also there's one edit in there too. It's so it's two pieces. But yeah, Eddie says there's he goes, I was mistaken there. Yeah, okay. Go tell Eddie. Go point out, hey Eddie, I found that mistake. I mean, you can't now. I was just watching something recently with, with him, uh, and I'm like, it's, it's amazing that he's not, you know, he's not around I, anymore. I know. I, I mean, the, we the, all the all the greats of today in, in in the metal genre. You got guys like you know everybody from from uh, George Lynch to, to a good friend of ours from Staten Island, the great Ron Thole, Bumblefoot, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani. They're all huge Eddie guys. I mean, he, he, even Ingbe talks about him in high regard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he, he's, he's, uh, they broke the mold. Like that, that's a guy that was put here for one reason. And we should all be glad that we shared in the time that he was alive you know i mean these are the types of things like the mozarts and the, and the beethoven's like oh, i was alive during that time or whatever because he was such an innovator there's there's a great i think it's a smithsonian uh video where they sit down with eddie van halen and he talks about all the inventions that he came up with that stuff that's now standards about uh dipping from from the the volt like using uh, screwing around with the voltage going into his amp to dipping uh, oh, pickups yeah. in in wax and and just like what, all these crazy he would like blow stuff up like hey, how he was still alive at the time like with the electricity he's messing around with but he's just one of those guys that put him in a room with a couple of wires and he's gonna come out with something that's gonna blow your mind. N not bad from a family from the Netherlands who started on drums, who now has his guitar in a museum in Washington D.C. Yeah, it's no, he's he's. Unfortunately, he's not. A, uh, he wasn't born in America, so he's not like you know. We can't claim him, but yeah. but his struggles and what he put up with to get he he lived yeah. the American dream more than you know. It's a whole. It's it's like one. It's like I always say. It's it's, a, it's one of those magic stories where it's like can't believe it. And you've uh, you're a great drummer. You've played in the Van Halen tribute band. Um, you did a lot of Van Halen. Talk to me about Alex, who started on guitar, and Eddie started on drums. But, but there's a, you see, a lot of times, and me and you will get this, and drummers will get this, we want to be best friends with the bass player. We do. Drummers. We, we want to lock in. Lock but I think, in. I think in this band, John, there was that connection with those, because a lot of the phrasing, a lot of the drum parts, yeah. they, they follow each other. 
oh yeah, no, there's there's a couple of guys out there, and and when I when I had to learn all those songs, that's the first thing you notice is that you you're really it's you and the guitar player that are really going at it. Bass player's there to keep the low end nice and smooth. Michael Anthony was great. He never he never had to do anything because of of yeah those two brothers going at it. But my style, well, my own personal style is is not like Alex. Right. And so I, but what was cool was after learning all those songs, I could then steal the parts that I liked from him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but uh, I'm saying like you learn new stuff and I'm like, oh, I never thought of it this way. They were very much into the upbeats. Like everything was always would end on some odd things. But, and but. that really would come from Eddie's feel. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was Alex's feel that Eddie copped. Or maybe it was Eddie's feel that Alex cop because like just a little those little um, bluesy or just not not even blues those little like jazz like the old style jazz type of things that they would their little hits you know mm-hmm. here or there would always be on upbeats and just like bat da bat you know it's stuff that you wouldn't hear in regular you know current yeah. modern rock at the time or whatever that's what gave them the, they they had that uh that swing thing uh, that that's the word I'm looking for they had that swing thing in there oh, and, and it was just beautiful you know. You got a song like I'm the One, you, like you just mentioned, has a double bass, but it's a, oh, oh, almost like a shuffle. Yeah, like almost. yeah it's, it's totally shuffle, but, but it swings, like the tempo goes up. I, it's, you know, that tempo is all yeah. over the place in that one. It don't yeah, yeah. matter. It don't matter because it's, it speeds where it's supposed to speed and slows where it's supposed to slow down, you know what I mean? But uh, speaking I, of Tony, Tony used to mount me to play that song at 300,000 miles an hour. <laughs> and I used to say, but now it's half a teacher, you know, but anyway. Hey. But... Uh, to- as as a drummer learning those songs was it um uh not saying was it difficult but did tell me go ahead it's definitely difficult because like i said i i'm i'm more of a like laid back groove guy or whatever and i like to do fills you know what i mean yeah alex is is a you gotta know all the moves when they're coming up and they're always uh they always seem improvised but they're not that they're always on point. Like just the cymbal hits during the, the the part going into the chorus of half a teacher. You know what I mean? No one was doing stuff like that. So it just was like, okay, my my brain went back. Oh, I gotta go to work. Like you know, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. gotta learn. Like I can't just be like, you can't um you know blue, bad company it. You know what I mean? You gotta literally learn it. And and I was never a, 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 a I was never thought that Alex was the greatest drummer in the world or anything like that, but you learn to play the songs and you, you get a little humbled and you learn some respect for, for a master yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's but, his own guy. I think he stole Bonham's snare sound and made it his own, but no, but I'm, that's great. That shows you that he was admired and, and, and you know, that that's where he, that's the guy who he's, who he was into, but yeah. he was not, he was not a Bonham. He didn't play like Bonham and not to degrade him. I'm saying they were just like yeah. Bonham was Bonham. And Alex is Alex, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, great discussion on Van Halen 1, Eddie and Alex. Uh, Johnny, good stuff, man. I appreciate the time again. Hey, anytime, Joe. All right. Thanks, bro. You got it, buddy. Take care, everyone. This portion of Around the Kid is sponsored by Merchandise Magic, the only merchandise company made for musicians by musicians. They are also veteran owned and operated enjoy 10 percent off your first bulk order with them and see for yourself why more musicians are choosing merchandise magic over anyone else for their merchandise and stage gear needs including t-shirts stickers bass drum decals backdrops koozies basically if you can imagine it they can make it Contact them today at Merchandise Magic on Facebook. That's Merchandise Magic on Facebook. Hey guys, we are back on Around the Kid uh, video live stream. Tremendous show today. Uh, Been trying to get this guest for many years. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to Around the Kid, Phil Ehart. Phil, what's up brother? Joe Gans is here. Joe Gansas, it's Phil from Kansas. How are you? I've been I've been waiting a long time to do that. By the way, I'm doing thank well. Thank thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's actually our honor. We're huge Kansas fans for a long time. We got so much to talk about. But how you doing today, bro? What's, what's going on? Uh, doing well. Doing well. Just uh, been hanging with my wife for a while today. We're off the road for a weekend. 
head back out next weekend. And so uh, um, looking forward to doing this. Good, good. We, 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 are, we are so happy to have you, and thank you for your time. It, it means so much to us. I like to paint a picture with my guests to go back a little bit. Coffeeville, Kansas. Love the name. Uh, just uh, love uh, the name Coffeeville. Talk to me about the early days growing up and where it all started for you, Phil Ehart, in grade school teaching yourself. Well, um, <laughs> That's a that's that's back our ways, uh, factually. But it's um, yeah. My dad was in the military. He was in the Air Force, and at a very early age, I was born in Coffeyville, Kansas, and born there. And then my dad hit the road and took the family with him, and uh, it was right after World War II. And um, we traveled all over the place. But uh, the Philippines. I lived in the Philippines for a couple of years. I lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, for a couple of years. Um, I lived in Detroit. Uh, I lived in the uh, Philippines, as well as Japan, as well as Montana, all in one sw swoop there. So um, I was pretty much by myself all the time because my dad had very obscure jobs working with uh, putting missiles in the ground during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And working on President Eisenhower's airplane, and yeah, I'm dating myself, but whatever. And it's the kind of thing that, uh, so I was in very obscure jungle type of places, and uh, that's where I taught myself uh, to play drums, I was sitting in a bedroom by myself, listening to the Beatles invasion, and teaching myself how to do that, and... Uh, that's where drumming started for me, was in very, very obscure places in the world where there were no drum teachers, there were no, there was nothing. It was just me and the radio, a couple drumsticks and a snare drum, and that was it. Yes, and I love the whole concept. It's a great story, but talk to me about that. My question to you, Phil, is, you know, traveling uh, the different countries, the different states, did that halter your early education to yourself? Did it make it more difficult because you were in and out of houses and always uh, new places? No, no, not really. I mean, li we, I lived on a base. So every time I went somewhere, I was on an Air Force base. And they were big, big air bases, little air bases. I went out in Great Falls, Montana, out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they, I was, but we finally settled in Topeka, Kansas. That's where my dad retired. And uh, that's where I actually ended up going to high school with the guys that ended up being in the band Kansas. So it was, uh, I just spent most of my time by myself in very obscure places, teaching myself basically a single stroke role. And that's about all I knew. And there wasn't any teachers around um, in, in those obscure places. So I tried to emulate as the best as the best I could emulate a drummer. I couldn't imitate a drummer because I didn't know what they were doing. So I would just kind of emulate and pretend I was doing that. And maybe I pulled it off pretty good over the years. I don't know, but uh, but that's where I came from. And so you can imagine when I run into you know super school drummers and and people that actually know what they're doing, how envious. <laughs> I am of that, but I'm so far past that, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I should have done that 30 or 40 years ago, but now I'm here, so I'm going to do this, And uh, but I have so much respect uh, for people that actually know what they're doing on a drum set. Well, let's talk about that, because I, I, I've talked to you off the air, and, and, and we, we've, we've, kid, we've kid around with that, um, who's overrated, who's underrated, the whole thing, uh, and what you just said now, I want to talk that back because you're a world class player. I don't even know if you believe that, but you've been doing this a long time. What do you mean when someone? Uh, I know you're kidding around, but what do you mean when somebody who actually knows what they're doing compared to you? I mean, tell me. Well, that took me a while, Joe, to figure that out. I mean, I spent a lot of just what, because entertainment in the Philippines or Japan or whatever was so limited. Um, the radio, the, the air base radio, was pretty much. So all I could do was listen. I, I couldn't, there was no MTV, no internet, nothing like that. Right. So I listened. I became a very, very good listener. What 
what is that guy doing? It sounds like the drumsticks are going zzzz. Well, I didn't know that, but it was a press roll. I, I had no idea what that was. So I would try to emulate that. And he's kind of doing that and pick it to bed. It's a, kind of a double stroke, ba 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 type. You know, I, I would just, that's all I could do. And, and, and so I would learn, you know, good old Ringo. Ringo would come along and he had the, the you know, great beats and great songs and it, it allowed me to get into the music. So I kind of jump frogged all the drumming for a while and just concentrating, concentrated on trying to be a good drummer uh, because I still wasn't in a band yet. I was only, was only 13, so I wasn't, I was shooting up across the world, but, um, but I did the best I could. That's, that's really all I could do is just do the best I could and, and hope someday to get in a band, which I was fortunate enough to do. Right. In, in, in your opinion, does uh, a great drummer have to play great to you? Have to play great? Yeah. Well, that helps. <laughs> sure, it helps. It sucks. It, it, I, I'm not sure I'm going to think he was a great drummer, but yeah. You mean like as far as being schooled and stuff like that or just... We, uh, because what we think is great is, is different, me and you. And someone could yeah. be, you know, you know what I'm saying? So maybe uh, you have a guy like, um, I always bring him up on the show, the, the great Phil Rudd from ACDC. What sure. he did was not elaborate, but it was great. It made him a great drummer. And then he got, only, you got a guy... He was, he was excellent. Yeah, and then he got... He was we, yeah. we go a guy yeah. like, like Thomas Lang who is a different ball game, also a great drummer, but they're different in, 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 in that greatness, you know? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think it's respect. Um, one of the musicians that has always been the epitome of respect for me is Steve Morse, guitar player, mm -hmm. uh, who was in our band for a couple albums. I mean, here's one of the greatest guitar players, whether you like him or not or whatever his style or he's one of the greatest guitar players. Uh, of all time. And every time he ran, you know, he and I would go to NAMM shows or whatever, and we'd run into another guitar player. He always took the time to compliment that person mm -hmm. who just thought, you know, I, I don't even deserve to wear your socks, you know, and Steve would always say something, would always bolster this person, would always give him a positive word, you know, do this and try that. And, and, and you can go here and never lose faith in yourself. And and I think we can all learn from that, just as just as people, you know, just as people to to support each other and be there for each other. It's it, instruments are hard, yes. hard to play. It's a great point and a great comment. So we, we we take somebody who's playing Madison Square Garden. Wow, he must be a great world class player. Well, why can't the guy in the subway station who puts out a change bag every day? And a subway musician, why can't he be great also? His time's coming. Yeah. His time's coming. I mean, believe me, I mean, while five or six of us were stuck on a school bus for year after year after year, driving around freaking Kansas in the dead of winter, I, I guarantee you many times we, did, we just kind of went, is this what we really want to do? Is this what we're trying? And yeah, we weren't going to give up, and we didn't. If I may, I think that changed for you um, as, as, as a 19 year old, you know, Phil Ehart, uh, the New Orleans Pop Festival, playing with Santana, Janis Joplin, hanging out sure. with uh, Jim Morrison, um, sure. and the whole thought process of what you wanted to do with the rest of your life. Was that an early game changing moment for you, Phil Ehart? Yeah, we were playing, it was a band called White Clover. There was five of us, and we did nothing but cover material. And we played uh, on Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. We played 89 nights out of 90. The only, only reason we didn't play that one night is the toilet overflowed. So they had to empty the club. We would have played otherwise. But we played four hours a night. And that's really where we learned our craft. You know, since we weren't in college or we weren't being schooled, we had to teach ourselves. And so we'd learn these songs and learn the different groups and learn time signatures. And in that little club, that's where we started to develop. And then the club owner came to us and said, you've probably heard of Woodstock. Well, it's coming to New Orleans. Uh, the, the New Orleans Pop Festival, I want you guys on the show. 
okay, <laughs> you know what? What right. if we were a, we were a cover band, you know? And uh, there was about sixty thousand people that night, and um, all you know, the, basically everybody that was at Woodstock came came down there. But it was one of those things. I was telling my wife the other day. I came off the stage on the first performance at at uh, the New Orleans Pop Festival, and I was walking off the stage, and I looked back, and sitting dead in front of me, just sitting there looking at me, was Janis Joplin, sitting outside her trailer. And she said, hey, don't you ever give up. You guys are fucking great. Excuse my language. No, it's cool. that's, that's, what, that's what she said. You guys are effing great. Don't ever give up. And I didn't. Did So do you look back, uh, I, I talked to your wife, is that something that sticks with you her, her, her words they still stuck with you all these years but see that's important for all of us joe oh yeah what, what we say to people makes a difference and and when i'd see you know steve morris say those things i just go god what i'm not sure i could do that i'm not sure i could you know right and he could and i learned from him and to this day i still do that because of him and i think it's uh, we we all owe that to all musicians, it's an art form. Oh, very few of us, very few of us get to do what I do. This is my 50th year in the band Kansas. Yeah. 50 freaking years of doing this. And I'm very fortunate and yeah. I don't take it for granted ever. And I don't think any of us should ever. Yeah. Guys, we're talking to the legendary Phil Ehart. He's been so nice to give us some time today. Where were we at this point in your life when you moved to London for three months? And what were you trying to achieve across the pond? Well, I had left New Orleans. I had, we had finished the pop festival. Our club date was done. I went back to Topeka. And of course, I had jammed with Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison from The Doors got up on stage with us, you know, at, at our club and did light my fire. And we played with Iron Butterfly. We played with Joe Cocker. We played the New Orleans Pop Festival. And then all of a sudden, I'm in Topeka, Kansas by myself, just sitting there going, um... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can do this. So I went to London. I just told my parents, I said, I'm gonna, I need to borrow some money. I'm going to London. My dad goes, oh, great. Who do you know over there? I go, nobody. Well, who are you going to stay with? Uh, I don't know. Well, where are you going to stay? Uh, probably or an apartment or they call them flats. I'm not sure what a flat right, is, but right. I'm sure I'll find out. Yeah. And I'm over there by myself. And I was over there for months till my visa ran out. Going to different bands, bands like Wishbone Ash and different bands that were, you know, trying things out and doing things. And I just played with a lot of different artists and my visa ran out because I couldn't secure a job. So then I came back and that's when I called the guys in Kansas. That's when I called Rich Williams, our guitar player, Steve Walsh. And they said, man, you're back. And I said, yeah, let's, let's, st let's start a band and do this for real. And that's, that's what got it going. Did you need the London experience or did you want it? Uh, you know, when you're that young and dumb, it, it's, you don't, that's too deep a question. You know, it's not like, well, I, I really want the experience. I just thought, well, my favorite band in the world is Deep Purple. Right. So I'm going to go where they are. Why would I even, why would I even think that? Yeah. I just thought, oh, they're coming out of there and all the different bands from England are coming out. Maybe I should go there. Here's the thing. They weren't interested in an American. And I don't say that politically. They weren't interested. They were more interested in me as a country western drummer, or a blues drummer, or a jazz drummer. Pick pick any one of the big American brands of music. That's what they wanted me to play. Yeah. Well, I'm not a snooty guy. I love blues. You know, I'm not a jazz drummer. But you know, it's uh, I could have, but the clock just ran out. It, it yeah. just ran. I had to come back. And it's a good thing it did because it all worked out for the best. I'm talking to you today. Yeah, absolutely. And we are lucky yeah. you're here and we thank you so much. You're a fan of so many different drummers from all the greats of yesterday and today. A good friend of your, Todd Sukerman, who we talked about, the late yeah. great Taylor Hawkins. But why, why Phil Ehart is Ian Pace your guy? Well, good question. It, I, I think back to Deep Purple. And of course, you know, Bonham was the rage. I mean, uh, rightly so, by the way. And um, 
But Ian, Ian had these chops that nobody else had, maybe except for Barrymore Barlow mm, from, uh, yeah. from uh, Tull. Yeah, Tull. You know? yeah. but, but the British drummers were a, a lot like drummers I, weren't, I wasn't familiar with. The way they played, they were so schooled and so smooth and so good at what they did. But Ian Pace, I just liked Deep Purple. I just liked that band, Ian Gillen, Richie Blackmore, what a guitar player. You know, that was a band because they had the interesting arrangements. They, their, their arrangements changed so much. And early Kansas arrangements oh, changed yeah. like that. So I was, uh, I was more at home with Ian Pace than I was the other uh, British drummers and uh, not comfortably at home. The guy was still is to this day. A force to be reckoned with, but uh, but yeah, I just really like Deep Purple to this day. Cool, awesome stuff. If we can, let's talk about a very influential man in the early days named Bud Carr, who took a lot of different roles and essentially was a very intricate part of the evolution of Kansas. Sure, well, Bud was our manager, okay, and he started out as our booking agent. And when we signed with Don Kirshner, we didn't have a manager. Uh, we didn't even have a road manager. We didn't even have any road crew. I mean, we were just six guys in Topeka. We were gonna pack up all our gear. And then they told us not to, you could just rent everything in New York. And so we got up there and you know, having to use rental gear to cut your first album, that's not really what we had in mind. But nobody met us at the airport. We were living on a dollar a day. That's what we were paid in New York. A dollar a day. Well, if you've ever been to New York, that's not going to work really well. But we went to the record plant and we started recording and Aerosmith was in there. John Lennon was in there. Yoko was in there. Rick Derringer in Kansas. You know, just these guys in their overalls and cowboy boots, you know, sitting in the record plant. And that's how it started for us. I mean, we we just kind of sat, sat there on our hands like I am right now and just kind of looking around waiting for shit to happen. Because we just didn't, well, what's supposed to happen now? Do we make a record now? Do we, we didn't have anybody helping us. We didn't even have an attorney. And uh, one of the record company guys said, well, you guys need to see an attorney. You need to see, you need to look at this recording contract. So he sent us to his attorney. <laughs> he sent us to his attorney. Well, we didn't know the difference. You know, we didn't know we were supposed to have our own attorney. Right, right. You're going to have my attorney because you're signing my contract. Worked out fine. Worked out fine. I, I will never diss, uh, none of us will ever diss Don Kirshner ever because without him, I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah, it was yeah. because of him and his opportunities that he gave us that the band was able to be successful. So it, it's a very odd story. And it's, uh, it, it's really, you know, rags to riches. I mean, you can't get much raggier than a dollar a day. And, and especially some of the guys that smoked <laughs> yeah. 50 or cigarettes or a quarter or whatever. But it, uh, we, we hung in there. We yeah. hung in and we, we've persevered. We've been very fortunate. But, but for many years now, you've taken on a much bigger role in Kansas, not just drummer, but uh, also management. Talk about that transition and how that's worked out for you. Well, um, <laughs> It was nothing, it's nothing I ever set out to do. I, I never said, not only do I want to be a really good drummer, I want to manage the band. Said no one ever, you know, I mean, it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of thing that um, no. certain things led to certain things. Uh, Bud, Bud Carr became one of the largest music supervisors for films uh, in the world. And uh, so to this day, he and I are still, you know, great friends. And I just kind of took over. I told Rich and Steve, I said, I'll take over management in the band until we get a manager. And that was 40 years ago. So I was always looking. We were interviewing other managers, but it never really fit us as well as I fit us at that particular time. And, uh, and it worked out great. And I'm still manager today. I keep waiting for the guys to fire me. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Maybe so. Who knows? I doubt it. All these years in Kansas and 
Who was on every album? You and who else? I forgot. Me, me, me and Richard Williams. Richard Williams on. Our I guitar think, I yeah. think to date, 16 albums, if I'm wrong, to date, 16? Yeah, it could be up around 16, 17, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. talk to me about that because, you know, there's been some change over the years in Kansas, but, you know, the back the backbone of the band has been there. That's got to say so much to, to the other guys coming in and out that, you know, you wanted to be there and, and, and you stayed this long. Well, I'm not sure I had a choice. You know, it was it was the kind of thing, you know, when I came back from England, Richard was the first guy I called. Yeah. I mean, he was really the, the very first guy. And then I called Steve Walsh and reached out to uh, blah, blah, blah. But, but Richard and I have been together through all of this. I mean, we figured out we've been together more with each other than we have been with our own wives, you know, our own family. And so it, it, it is very much... Uh, sealed in that sweat and sealed in you know the all the 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 many millions of miles that we've traveled and the gigs that we've played and the records that we've made and the failures that we've had it hasn't been you know roses for everything it, it's been an uphill battle but i wouldn't i wouldn't trade it for anything it's the only way to go it's a great job and i've never had a job i've never had a job the only job I've ever had is playing drums for Kansas, and I'll take it. If you think about it, do, do you, even you've done all the hard work over 50 years, do you still need to apply hard hard work to this project? Oh, oh more than ever. There, there are no laurels anymore, you know. It's not, it's not like, well, the first album we had this hit, and then the second album. We, and then the song Wayward Son came along, and boom, it blows. And then, oh, wait a minute. Then there was Point of No Return, that exploded. And then, oh yeah, there was, what's that song? Oh yeah, Dust in the Wind, that came on. Boom, I mean, it was, we were all just sitting there going, this is unbelievable. And now we're, we're playing stadiums, you know, we're opening for the Stones in front of 80,000 people. And then we're playing our own stadiums and Van Halen's opening for us. And, and it just, if you don't pay attention Wrong. Yeah. So we pay attention, and we're just happy to be here. You know. Yes. Still, still. Phil, uh, I've invited a, a good friend of the show to come on because he's a huge fan. Uh, he's also a Yamaha artist. He's a world class player, professional drummer. His name is Jason Gianni. Hopefully, we can bring him on now, and he wants to just uh, maybe ask you question. What's up, Jay? Can't hear you, dude. Can't hear you. Can you make it a little louder, Jason? Very low. Very low. Nothing, dude. Nothing yet. Yeah, nothing. Anything muted? Is anything muted at all? No? Well, that's a drag because I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> Jay, can you yell? I'm, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> Nothing? He, he, he's gone. He's in a soundproof room, it looks like. I mean, he's in a bass drum. Can you get to another microphone or something? Jay, your mic is muted. Un unmuted. A little better, okay. a little better. Yeah, I think I heard you. Yell again. Hey, hey, hey can you hear me at all? I, I can hear you at distance. I, I can see you. A little better. Okay. Hi, hi. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's happening. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, if you could just talk a little louder, maybe we, 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 we can get I it can going. Hear you. Okay, I, can hear you. I don't know what's going on. Phil, it's good to see you, man. Hey, man. How are you? I, I'm well, thank you. Good, good, good. Um, we've seen each other at Yamaha events before. Yes, no, I, I, I remember your face, yeah. Yeah, man, yeah. it's good to see you. Uh, I just got to see you at the uh, the Balloon Festival in New Jersey. Uh, I missed I missed saying hello, but I was with uh, my friend Tom Brislin. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, it's wonderful. But uh, I just wanted to say hello. And uh, Joe uh, wanted me to ask you a question. 
besides saying hello. So uh, I figured I'd ask real quick and say, um, you know, back in, in record one, when you guys already established your sound, and uh, there's a song like, say, uh, Journey from Maria Braun. Uh, did you guys know right away that, you know, this was something new and fresh and something not, nobody had really sort of done at that time? Well, we, we would hope so. I mean, Journey from Mary Braun um, was the kind of thing that we just worked it up at rehearsals. Um, it, it's not exactly the easiest song to play drum-wise. And, and it's the kind of thing, and a lot of Kansas songs are not the easiest song. But that was one of the first songs in our career that had that kind of heavy progressive, just progressiveness. And Carrie kind of took off from there and those seeds were planted. That song had a lot to do as to where Kansas went for the next 20 years. And, and Steve singing, what an incredible vocal he put on that. We had the violin. I mean, it was, it was uh, that was a song where you just kind of get out of the way. And what was interesting, where the song went over really well is when we opened for Queen, of all bands, you know. <laughs> I remember Roger Taylor really liked Journey from Mary Abroad. And I said, you do? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's insane. It's insane, mate. It's insane. I said, well, yeah, it is insane. But uh, those are the tours that we did with Queen, and they were insane. So, uh, so yeah, well, thank you. I'm glad you like that song. Thanks. I do, too. Oh, yeah. To me, uh, to me, it set the precedent for everything I love from you guys over the next, you know, uh, I, I, I have everything from you guys, but like certainly over the next, you know, five, six records. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm somewhat of a music historian, so I always look at the, the musicians who sort of do things for the first time, you know, the first time a, a mambo was ever created, the first time a drum set samba was ever created, you know, and, and those early bands like you guys and ELP and, uh, you know, to me that was such a, a huge stepping stone in what happened musically at that time, that then it's hard to keep it up for the next Yeah. Years. <laughs> Yes, they were very hard to play with, because we didn't even know what a click track was. We just went in there and counted them out, and we'd play it from beginning to end, because we couldn't stop, because we didn't have any way of punching in the band or doing anything like that. So everything was done in one take, the majority of it. And one of the songs was 12 minutes long with a drum solo, and it had to be right from beginning to end. Gee, no, no stress, no pressure. You know, so, uh, but I didn't know any differently. Yeah. I, I was just happy to be there. I'm in New York and, and John Lennon's upstairs in the studio. You know, th this is cool. I can do this. You know, so. If if I can, Jason, before you go, Jason, yeah. in a couple, a couple of minutes, uh, what is Phil Ehart's style of drumming to you? Well, um, I think my, my favorite uh, word to use with Phil is orchestration. Um, you know, the idea of orchestrating your drum part to be more than just a drummer, to be part of the music, to be part of the, the tone of what's going on, uh, the way he puts his accents, the way he puts his snare drum on one with a crash rather than a bass drum. Uh, that is so much part of the music rather than just part of the backbone of a regular groove. And Phil has a wonderful groove, uh, but he has such wonderful musicality too. And that's what, or, that, that's what really inspired me as a drummer uh, to be more uh, creative, creative and musical. And, um, and you know, just, just instead of just playing the role of a timekeeper, it's more than that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. That's beautiful. I've never had anybody ever Tell me that. I had no idea I could do all that. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Well, Thanks. Jason, I know you got to go. I appreciate so much the great Jason Gianni for coming on for a little while, bro. It's really nice meeting you. It's great yeah. meeting you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And it's good seeing you again. Uh, we'll see each other at another Yamaha event at some point. All right, man. I'll look for you. Okay, brother. I'll see you. Later. Thanks, Jason Gianni. Oh, great stuff. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Uh, Jason, Johnny, we are in the middle of this great Phil Ehart interview. You know, talking about these songs and going back, um, 
we go to concerts and we like to hear new stuff from the bands uh, and the catalog, you know, 16, 17 albums. There's uh, hundreds of songs. Um, how important is it to play the big hits? And even more, do you think Kansas and all these legendary bands have a responsibility to the crowd to do them? Well, yeah, people are paying to come see you. You know, get off your high horse and play your hits. Yeah. You know, that that's not their fault that you guys are famous and have big hits. I mean, it's 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 the horse you rode in on. And so it just so happens one of my favorite songs we've ever recorded is Carry On Wayward Son. I, I actually like that song. It's actually a fun song to drum to. And I know it's made a lot of drummers' lives hell, but <laughs> it, it's the kind of thing that I just... I like playing it. And of course, that opening, don't you cry, no boom, 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 whack. You know, the whole place just goes freaking crazy. And that part wasn't even supposed to be in there. When we were recording the song, again, we had no click tracks. So, you know, the, the a cappella vo vocals are going over. And, and I just put that doom, 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 whack as, actually, it's a bass drum, doom, 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 whack, as a placekeeper. And then I was going to come back and don't you cry, no, you know, I was going to do something fancy. Well, everybody liked the doom, 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 doom. Everybody's going, Phil, just leave that. It's great. So accidentally, it, it was left in there. And uh, that song, Wayward Son, wasn't even supposed to be on the album. We had already worked up, rehearsed all our songs for Left Overture. And we were packing our stuff up and Terry Livner, and our guitar player, came over and he said, Phil, um, I've got one more song. I said, well, Carrie, we've already packed everything up. He said, well, let's work it up down in Bogalusa, down in Louisiana. And I said, okay. So we got down there, not having a clue as to what it was like. We learned the song and we recorded it the same day. It was like, that's really good. Let's, let's put that down. And, and so we did. Steve wasn't even there. He'd had a death in the family. And he came back and, you know, he added the acapella vocals and we turned it and we just polished that thing up right there on the you know right in the studio on the day that we probably within 24 hours of learning it we got it all done and the next thing we knew we had a huge hit hit single so don't don't make any plans yeah. <laughs> they will change yeah you know? yeah we it, were very fortunate with it's, Wayward a, Son. it's a great testament to we hear we hear a stairway to heaven it was written in 12 minutes. Sometimes mm -hmm. the magic just happens, you know? It just get out of the way. You just yeah. need to get out yeah. of it. You know, it doesn't need anything. Just get out of the way. And we did. So we were fortunate. Same with Dust in the Wind. It was a finger exercise. Carrie was practicing on acoustic guitar. And his wife heard him practicing and said, honey, you need to make that into a song. So he did. Biggest song I've ever had. And a song that you had... Uh, uh, co-written on was Point of No Return. It's actually uh -huh. it's actually my favorite Kansas song. I just love ba -da, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Ah, See, I, I would do it so I, how we would do it. I, I play a lot of songs where I change it up, so I would I would double bass that part, but it's, oh. it's a, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool ba -da, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba It'd be cool to do that, you know. Don't yeah, do that yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get that out of my head now. Uh, Phil's like, oh, Joe, why'd you do that to uh, me? <laughs> what I could have done, yes. You know, that could, out... you, you could have been somebody, Phil, see? I could have. I could have been a contender. Maybe, yeah. we, get, maybe we get Joe Gansis in Kansas. It's a natural. <laughs> but is, is that song a little extra special to you because you had a hand in that one? Well... Um, actually, I came up with the album cover uh, yeah. for the album Point of No Return, and I came up uh, with, the, with the cover. Uh, well, I didn't come up with it. I, my concept of the ship going over and, and Peter Lloyd, the artist, is who he gets the credit for the album cover. He did that. But the title was mine. And our manager, Bud Carr, said, why don't you make it K-N-O-W? OK, great. So Point of No Return was my title. And Steve gave me credit as the songwriter because he used it in the chorus, and it's the name of the song. So, yeah. So I was very fortunate just to be hanging around at the right time. What has always because uh, we've talked about 
we talked about songs that are three or four, five minutes long, 10, 12 minute long, and, and the catalog is, is so vast. What has always been your thought process, Phil Ehart, in, in, in writing drum parts and arranging? Is there always been a, a, a place you went to, 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 to think about what you want to do in each song? I've never been asked that question, Joe. I have never, that is an awesome question. Um, wow. Well, I, I will tell you that probably the majority of the 15, 16, 17, 18 albums that we've done, I, I have written every drum part to every song. Now, what does that mean exactly? Am I sitting down and notating everything? No, I, I'm. I'm having, as Carrie is showing everybody the song, he'll, you know, look over to Rich and show Rich some of the chords, and Rich will take it from there and come up with a, he would have shown Robbie, rest his soul, the, the violin parts and that kind of stuff. And, of course, he wrote the lyrics, and so he's showing people lyrics and stuff. He didn't show me much. He, I, I'd look, I'd go, Carrie, what do you want me to play there? Oh, just something in, you know, 9-8 it'd be good. Go, uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> right, right, right. And he goes, okay, well, just follow this riff. And he'd go, and and I'd start, you know, putting stuff together, and and I would build my own parts. They were all my own parts, whether they were great or whether they were average or whatever. They were the the best I could do on my limited limited knowledge, and. It, it's interesting. I, I won't mention his name because he's such a good friend. But I had a very famous drummer one time tell me. He said, Phil, don't change your style. Don't, don't, don't start learning to read. Don't start taking lessons. Don't do that. And if I told you who this was, you'd go, holy shit. But he said, what you've done, what you've come up with, and, I, and I, I didn't know that. I had no idea what he was talking about. Right. But he said, you've developed a style, and you're, it's your drum style and the music of Kansas, which forms the rhythm section of, of what you guys are doing with Dave Hope on bass, tremendous bass player. Yeah. And, and so it's the thing, nobody messed with it. You know, it was like, don't touch it because it, it well, worked. Well, and, yeah. if, it, if it's not broke, I mean, I, I, you yeah. know... I, I, but Joe, that's a lot of songs for for me to carry, you know. And and I will say that the songwriters uh, were also very outspoken. If I did something they didn't like, or wanted a hi hat to do something, or a different accent, or but most of those drum parts are my drum parts. Yes. So I'm very proud of that, you know. It, it's uh, uh, with the help uh, of the composer of the song. So it uh, it has they've stood the test of time, maybe regardless of the educational foundation that I have or don't have. It doesn't seem to make any difference because the music seems to cut through on its own, and I'm very grateful for that, and, and very grateful to my bandmates yeah. who have also made suggestions and also made recommendations over time too. You know, we, we're a band. We were a band, six guys, original guys, and we we worked tightly together and we still do still yeah do. it's a great testament to, to what you said uh maybe you're not this uh uh brilliant educated drummer who can write out charts and everything or can't read but it, it's there's nothing wrong with that by the way i, right. I don't want anybody to oh no have a problem. I, yes I just... no i'm the same way yes but you, uh, you know uh but is it always about that is it always like you go into the studio and they give you a uh uh, a, a certain time temperature, uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, you know, a certain time frame to play a song. I don't know what yeah. that is. And they go, dan, dan, da, 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 dan, 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 da, 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 dan, dan. You play the beat. So you actually, you're, you're actually educating yourself. I don't even think you knew it. No, I did not. Yeah. The first time I ever did was a gentleman named Billy Cobham. Yeah. When Mahavishnu Orchestra came out and everybody of my ilk couldn't even move after watching them or listening to them, you know? And I remember reading an interview with Billy Cobham and they said, well, Billy, how do you count all those long, you know, soaring solos and stuff and all this stuff? And he goes, I don't count any of that. He said, I play to the melody. 
And I mean the heavens open yeah. for you. You know, because play like to the melody, play to the melody. That changed my whole approach of how I played the Kansas music. And I ran into him at a NAMM show because he was a Yamaha guy. And I told him how much he uh, had changed my uh, my style. And he said, well, God, I hope for the better. And I said, yeah, it was, it was a, a much a huge relief that I didn't have to. He said, so you tried to count all that? And I said, kind of. I kind of broke it up into fours, you know, and did the best I could. But no, I, I, the, the, the phrases were too long. But he said, well, same with the Mahavishnu. He said, you just play play by feel. And yeah. I did. Yeah. Uh, Still do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, over 50 years in the business, what's one of the biggest lessons you've learned about yourself over that time span? That I've learned about myself? <sighs> you really come up with good questions, dude. These are good questions. These are really, what have I learned about myself? Thanks, bro. Well, I think it's it's uh, it's dedication. I, I I don't think any I don't think just anybody can do what I do, or successful musicians. I don't think just anybody can do them. I'm not even sure it can be taught. Right, right. I'm not sure it can even be taught. It's the kind of thing that uh, one of the things that I've learned is there's an awful lot of luck in this business. Where one guy showed up for an audition and didn't get the gig, and the next guy walked in and auditioned for Toto and got the gig, and off they went. You know, And, and it's the kind of thing that that is so huge in this business and in all instruments. But then you sit, you know, we all sit around like drummers and like idiots and watch Buddy Rich. You know, a self-taught marvel. <laughs> You know, a self-taught, the greatest drummer of, of all time. And there's there's some there's some pretty salty guys that are coming up behind you. Yeah. yeah. But uh, he will be, to me, the greatest. And it's uh, so he made his own breaks. He went left. He went right. He went up. He went down. He was he was truly truly incredible. And there's a lot of incredible musicians. But all I can be is true to myself. Yes. That's that's it. I, I can't be Buddy Rich. I can't be, you know, any any great drummer out there because they're the great drummers. And it's all I can do is do the best I can for the band Kansas. Bunny Bunny Carlos said yeah. something to me once. He goes, "I'm not the best drummer in the world, but I'm the best drummer for Cheap Trick." Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, would anybody argue with that? I wouldn't. We so wish, all, I, yeah. all I can be is the best drummer for Kansas, and hopefully after 50 years, I hope I've earned that. But it's uh, you have to earn it. You got to come every night and bring everything you got. If and, you know, do it. If you and if you and Phil Rudd swap places, I don't think it would be good. I don't think no. you know. It, so no. it, yeah, he wouldn't have any fun. <laughs> <laughs> you have there going. Uh, wait a minute! I thought this was in four. No, we don't have anything in four, Phil. Just play over. No, he, he, he would do fine. He's got a great groove. He's got a great yeah. feet, and he knows how to play the drums. You mentioned before that it, it can't be taught, and I think that's such a, a powerful statement because it's just you. But the the analogy is Phil Ehart that you, you have a guy that went to college for twelve years. And you have a high school dropout. Let's see what happens. I you know, agree. Let's let's see what happens. You know, is is all that is that twelve years of college going to actually make you smarter? Because I didn't go to school. You know, I, I, I don't know. And, and the good news is, I don't think we'll ever have to find out. <laughs> you know, it's. Yeah. Um, uh, let me put it this way. If I would have lived in a place where I could have gotten schooling and my mom and dad could afford to send me to places like that, I would have been there in a second. So there was never an attitude of me looking down my nose or looking up my nose at people. It was, there's, Phil, you live in Clark Air Force Base, Philippines. There's no drum teachers, you know, so figure it out. Here's a snare drum and here's some drumsticks. Good luck. And that that's... That's the cards that life plays you sometimes. You try to make the best, but I think it would, you know, 
I, I would never say uh, that I wouldn't want to read or that I wouldn't want to know rudiments. I, I, I've never even been taught rudiments. Now, to some people, that would be an abomination. In fact, right now, they would turn, they would turn this program off. <laughs> I guarantee it because they've done it in front of me. They just walked out when I told them that because they wanted to know my education and I told them I was self-taught. They got up and left the clinic. About 200 of them. Now, this is after, this is after about, about 15 million records sold. So I'd actually done fairly well for myself. But I started doing clinics for Yamaha. And people started asking me, well, obviously, this is what they, obviously, you must be self-taught. You, you must be uh, a schooled. You know, how did, what did you teach yourself? And I said, well, I, I'm not schooled. What do you mean you're not schooled? Well, what, you don't know this or that? No, I don't know this or that. Off they go. Well, I would have just handed them 16 albums and shut them up. <laughs> well, it, it, no? it did hurt. You know, it, it, it was hurtful because, you know, it, it's, you try. You know, I was handed a certain deck of cards and that's all I could play. And I had to make the best of it. And when Kansas needed a drummer in the state of Kansas, choice wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't a big array of drummers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like me and another jazz guy. And that's it. That was it. That's, that's who was in the band. And that's who went on. And that's still who's in the band. So it, it, uh, you can never give up. You can never give up. Don't ever think you know it all. Don't ever, ever think you know it all. Yeah. That's, uh, you'll, you'll die quickly you know, on the vine. So in my, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, guys, the legendary Phil E. Hart, he's been so nice to give us some time today. Let's talk about that. I got a couple more and I, I'm just so uh, appreciated this time with you. Um, okay. What are we doing now? Uh, you've, you've accomplished, have you guys accomplished a lot? And it's a question that you probably say, well, of course we did, Joe. We have 16 albums and we played uh, all the middle. But have you guys accomplished enough for yourselves internally that you, you're content? Another good question. Um, I, I think we, I think you, when you do something for a career, you, you know, it starts to narrow. The hallway starts to narrow as you start getting farther down the hallway. And, and of course, Kansas has accomplished a lot. You know, I'm very proud of our, our London Symphony performance. You know, us playing Kansas music with the London Symphony Orchestra recorded in Abbey Road. Well, everybody that has those albums, hold them up. You know, you, oh, no, you guys didn't get to do that. Okay. We got to do that. How lucky were we, you know, in Abbey Road? And, it, and, and so when you accomplish something like that, it may not make any waves anywhere. You may not read about it anywhere. It's not on any charts or something. But that's a recording. That, that is something that's very special that we got to do symphonically with Kansas music. Well, another reason that we're very fortunate is Kansas music is very symphonically laced with, with, the, with the, the strings and all the percussion and everything that goes with it. It actually fits, you know, the symphony fits well. So that was, that was a turn that we took for a year or two. And, um, and it was awesome. It was, it was really great. I mean, all the things that we've done and accomplished were, you know, we're, we're so grateful to, to be able to do it because we're just, we're just punks from Topeka. We, we really are. We're just guys that play clubs uh, played sweaty, vomit-soaked, you know, clubs everywhere, and you know, rodeos, biker rallies, and stuff. That's that's what we that's what we played. So we're very fortunate to come out, and and uh, we're we're very proud to be there. And uh, and and I know how difficult it is for other people. I don't care how schooled they are. There's always competition. You know, I don't care how schooled those Air Force drummers are or those Marine drummers are. When they go there, they got about 44 guys they got to beat out just to get, you know, the snare drum uh, to march uh, with the uh, funerals. There's, there's thousands of those guys that try out for those things. Those guys are freaking awesome. Looks like something anybody could do. Yeah, good luck. So it's, um, it, it, it is the kind of thing that, 
I do, do I look at as a kind of a panacea of Kansas things we've accomplished? Sure. Are we still accomplishing things? Sure. And are we going to keep trying? Sure. Until we look at each other and go, you know, we've pretty much done it all. Wish you the best. Shake hands, bro hug, ride off into the sunset. Yes, and I'm just sitting here thinking about this. Uh, great comments by you. All the success. And it's another de uh, a deep question. Can we still, uh, I'm going to ask this, can we still welcome failure? In, in the music business or what, just in general? Everything you do in Kansas. I mean, because you, you're going to still make mistakes. Is, is, is that something you still have to say to yourself, you know, it, it's possible that even we're a famous band, we're going to still fail. Oh, oh, very much so. We, we have gigs at night where we stink. You know, it's like, <laughs> wow, what band was that? But that happens to all bands. You sit around with your bandmates and you talk yeah. about stuff. Everybody, uh, you know, goes, oh, yeah, that's happened to us. Oh, God, we had to leave the stage. Yeah, what's his name screwed up so bad that we had to go do this or that? And it, it, it happens to everyone. And that's why they have things called rehearsals. Because you better make a mistake. I better not make a mistake in front of all these other guys who are busting their butts. But there's a thing in Kansas. You don't want to be the low man on the totem pole in the band Kansas. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. Right, right, right. <laughs> standing in front of these guys and them looking at me. We're all going. Um, so we all work our butts off. Before we play every night, we practice for an hour and a half backstage. With our, with our muted instruments and stuff, going through the whole set before we even go play. Just to make sure that we're dialed in and ready to go, and we're gonna give the people everything we can the best way we can. Will we make mistakes? Oh yeah, it's gonna happen. But we're giving a shit, we are trying. We're not up there, you know, yeah, glad you guys made the show, hope you guys, sorry we sucked. No, that that's not, that's not us. Take it very, very seriously, and we do every night we play. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a a, a career of you guys, especially you, of dedication and passion, and doing something that you didn't even know was going to happen, but it all came into fruition after yeah. after London. You 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 made up your mind. Um, uh, Kansas has created this this entity, uh, uh, millions of albums, 16, 17, uh, millions of fans, all the world tours. It's, it, it's a great testament. And I know it's a, cl a cliche that that hard work pays off, Phil. You hope so. <laughs> it, it's too hard if it doesn't. You know, it, it, uh, it, there's a lot of luck. And, it, and that luck has to do with how hard you work. Yeah. If you don't work hard, you're not going to have much good luck. Yeah. Not, not much is going to happen to you. You're not going to fall into some things where I'm going to try this role tonight. Holy shit, I can't believe I actually played it. I've been trying to do that. You know, and okay, great. And the guys are looking at me going, hey, that was great. Uh, yeah, who knew? 50 years later, I'd come up with a new lick, you know. But it's, um, it, it's also a lot of fun, Joe. Yeah, yeah. It's also an awful lot of fun to play in a band like Kansas. It's, um, it's, it kicks your ass, but it's a lot of fun. Oh, uh, my last question is involves you, uh, uh, 72 years old. You look phenomenal by the way. And I'm not, I never bullshit. Oh. You look, you look tremendous brother. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, seriously, uh, I'm, I'm 53 and I, I look older than you probably, but, um, to talk to me about the body, you know, playing 50 years and it's not two, three minute songs. How has the body over the years held up? And are you, are you playing different than 50 years ago? I mean, just, uh, it, it, it happens. Well, uh, <laughs> I've had to make quite a few changes, you know, uh, in, in how I play and how I exercise, how I stretch because of a 72 year old body is not a 22 year old body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these Kansas songs were written in my 20s. I'm now playing them in my 70s. Who 
who thought that was a good idea. You know? <laughs> so so it, it's the kind of thing that, uh, but, you know, I run into Rod Morgenstein and guys, you know, uh, guys that have been my friends for uh, so long. And that's what we talk about. You know, Matt Frenette from, uh, from Loverboy and stuff. We, we talk about, dude, how you stay in shape. You know, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. And I, I try to do this. So the night, oh, God, I pull something, you know, I, you know, I can't do that anymore. It's, um, it's not a pitiful thing. I, I think if you couldn't proficiently play your instrument, you, I would imagine most guys would step down. So you try to, you try to work on better things and take care of yourself. And uh, there's a whole new regimen, workout regimen out there now for drummer, for classic rock drummers. Yeah. Because most of us are in our 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. That used to be an age that people would even laugh at if you tried to play in a rock band. Right. But look at Charlie Watts, rest his soul. Yeah. The guy, the guy, was awesome, yeah. right up, right up to the end, you know. And and um, so that's what you do. You you. What can I do proficiently? What can I do professionally? What can I do percussion wise? Every night to get up there and bring to the party what I need to bring. If I can't do it, I got to be honest with myself. Is 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 the mental aspect more involved now? Yes, very much so. Very, very much so. Because I because because and I'm speaking for me because I'm the manager of the band. Yeah. So I've got all the stuff all day. Whether we're getting there, whether we're getting back. I mean, the road managers take care of stuff, but you know, the gigs, the recordings, all the stuff, the just the warfare within the band. You know, just the the people's. You know, well, I'm unhappy with this or that. You know, the the personalities that I have to deal with. Nobody else has to deal with them. I have to deal with it. You know, so and that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But there's a lot of band stuff in my life that someday I need to walk away from because I won't be able to do it as well as I can do it today. And um, so I'm hanging in there, doing the best I can. Well, we hope that time never comes. But if it does, here's the headline: Kansas and Kansas. <laughs> Come on, no, I, you I, go. You go ahead with that. I like that. You go ahead. <laughs> I like it. Thank, thank you again so much for having me. Well, Phil, it, it, was, uh, it was excellent. I, excellent. I, I, I have to ask you because I've asked this question before we go to over uh, 370 drummers, and it's an honest answer. So I need an honest, uh, uh, honest question, honest answer. Phil Ehart, how would you rate this interview, honestly? Uh, like on a 1 to 10 or, or what? Yeah, 1 to 20 for me, probably. 120, 1 to 120. It was excellent. I would give it an A+. Plus. I would give it a 100. Good, brother. I appreciate and, this so much. And I've, had a, I've, I've done a lot of these. And, and you thought about your questions. And, and you gave me a chance to talk, which is very rare lots of times. Uh you know, it's the guy's show, and so you come on the guy's show, and you might get in a couple sentences or whatever. But you were very uh, magnanimous in, in letting me talk. So I appreciate it. We appreciate you guys, the legendary Phil Ehart. We will check you out coming up. Um, and we thank you for this time, brother, so much. We've been trying to get you for a long time. And I got to thank Mike Vanderhoel yes. for, for having us connect us. So thank you, Mike Vanderhoel. Phil E. Hutt, it's been a pleasure. You're a gentleman and a true legend, and we say thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Good luck to you. All right. The great feel. Thank Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. All right, man. Oh, guys, guys, great stuff. Uh, tremendous stuff there. Kansas in Kansas. Once again, we say thank you. Legendary Phil E. Hart. All right. We are back once again with another amazing night of all things drummers, drums, and drumming. Hello, everyone. This is Doug Miola with our new Around the Kid Spotlight Drummer series. Tonight's Spotlight Drummer is Frankie Benali. Frankie was born Francisco Felice Benali on November 14, 1951, in Queens, New York. He was born to Italian immigrants Jack and Martha Benali. Frankie had a pretty typical Italian upbringing, and he fell in love with drums and drumming. His main influences included John Bonham and Buddy Rich, as well as Simon Phillips, Dennis Chambers, 
and Vinnie Colaiuto, to name a few. Sadly, Frankie's father, Jack, died from pancreatic cancer in 1974. Frankie then moved to Los Angeles in 1975, where he spent four years playing drums with various bands, including a reformed Steppenwolf with Nick St. Nicholas and Goldie McJohn. Frankie quickly built up a stellar reputation as a session player and played on many hits for other artists, including Billy Idol's Moni Moni and L.A. Woman, as well as over a hundred other recordings. Frankie also played drums on the acclaimed Hughes Thrall album with Glenn Hughes and Pat Thrall. In 1979, Frankie, along with bassist Dana Strum, was in secret rehearsals with Quiet Riot guitarist Randy Rhodes and Ozzy Osbourne, who was looking for a guitar player to launch his new solo band. Frankie worked with Ozzy, Randy, and Dana on pre-production for the first solo Ozzy Osbourne album. Originally, they were going to record the record in L.A., but Jet Records had spent so much money flying Ozzy between London, L.A., and New York looking for musicians, and they were really unsure of what Ozzy's future was ultimately going to be. They decided to just record in England because it would be less expensive and they would only pay to fly one other band member over. Obviously, that guy was Randy Rhodes. So unfortunately, Frankie's involvement with Ozzy was short-lived. In 1980, Frankie joined forces with Kevin Dubrow and formed Dubrow, which had a revolving door of musicians before settling with former Snow guitarist Carlos Cavazzo and bassist Chuck Wright. When Rudy Sarzo stepped in to replace Chuck Wright, Dubrow changed the name of the group to Quiet Riot. This was the same name of the band that Dubrow, Sarzo, and Randy Rhodes had used prior to Sarzo and Rhodes leaving to join Ozzy Osbourne's band. After signing with Pasha Records in September 1982, Frankie and Quiet Riot found success with the album Mental Health, which was released six months after signing their deal with Pasha Records. In November 1983, only eight months after its release, Mental Health reached the number one spot on the Billboard 200 charts, replacing The Police's Synchronicity, making it the first heavy metal album to go number one on the charts. Mental Health eventually sold over 10 million copies worldwide and helped usher in the decade of heavy metal hair rock. By the time Condition Critical was released in July 1984, tensions began to slowly break Quiet Riot apart, but Frankie held on through lineup changes and a diminishing fan base, mostly caused by Kevin Dubrow's erratic behavior. By 1989, Quiet Riot disbanded after touring in support of their self-titled debut album, which was released in October 1988. Around the time of recording their self-titled album, Frankie also played drums for the band Wasp on their Headless Children album. After Quiet Riot disbanded again, he rejoined Wasp to tour in support of the album. In 1990, Frankie was called in by Faster Pussycat to replace Mark Michaels, who was fired from the band during their tour in support of their 1989 album, Wake Me When It's Over. Frankie's mother, Martha, died after an eight-year battle with breast cancer on November 14, 1990. After regrouping from this devastating loss, Frankie formed a band called Heavy Bones with guitarist Gary Hoey. They released one album in 1992 before disbanding. In 1993, Frankie rejoined Quiet Riot after Bobby Rondinelli left the band to join Black Sabbath. In 1994, Frankie also took over as the band's manager, overseeing the band's business decisions. After three albums and more lineup changes, Quiet Riot disbanded again in 2003. Over their career, Quiet Riot had a number of hit singles, including Party All Night, Twilight Hotel, The Wild and the Young, Bang Your Head, Mental Health, Mama, We're All Crazy Now, and Come On, Feel the Noise. Frankie married his first wife, Karen, in 1994. On February 17, 1997, his daughter, Ashley, was born. On April 14, 2009, Karen died from heart failure at the age of 40. Once again, Frankie and Kevin Dubrow reformed Quiet Riot in October 2004 with bassist Chuck Wright and new guitarist Alex Grassi. They released one album with that lineup titled Rehab in 2006, before the untimely death of Dubrow in November 2007. 
Frankie announced the dissolving of Quiet Riot on January 14th, 2008. In September 2010, Frankie, with the blessing of Kevin Dubrow's family, reformed Quiet Riot. Frankie continued to carry on the legacy of Quiet Riot through 2018. On November 11, 2015, Frankie married his second wife, Regina Russell Benali, who produced and directed a documentary about Quiet Riot called Quiet Riot. Well, now you're here. There's no way back. In October 2019, Frankie revealed that he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Frankie fought ferociously to battle this disease. However, he sadly passed on August 20th, 2020, at the age of 68. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to meet Frankie and to be able to tell him how much he influenced me as a young drummer. We talked several times and bonded over our love of drums, John Bonham, and vintage drums and gear. He was a very gracious, humble, and super knowledgeable person. Frankie was a guest and a friend of ours here at Around the Kit, and we miss him and his presence. Thank you, Frankie, for your incredible inspiration and friendship and for sharing your amazing gifts and talents with us. You have touched so many lives, and we will continue to honor you and your legacy. Rest in peace, Frankie. We miss you.
guys, we are back around the kit video live stream. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back to around the kit the tremendous Mark Zonder. Mark Joe Gans, what's up, brother? Not too much, just sweating it out here in uh, Southern California, but uh, all good, man. I mean, you know, I'm glad everybody's better. You know, I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. I'm glad everybody got over COVID and we're good yeah. to go. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, first of all, uh, I talked to you uh, on, on Facebook and Messenger, but text. But how you doing, bro? What's going on today? How, how's everything going? Good. Just busy and crazy. Same old thing. You know, 16-year-old twins, married, you know, the usual, 10-pound Yorkie. You know, it's <laughs> never-ending, man, never-ending. Um, we've had some great conversations over the years, and today I want to focus on this, this tremendous album, that you've shared with me uh, behind the scenes, uh, but and I love that um, A through Z uh, and uh, the self-titled album A through Z doing great, uh, and it means anything is possible. I love that whole meaning and the concept of everything um, on the charts. It's just kicking ass. Talk to me about, and I I want to start with with you. You were doing this a long time. Uh, my first recollection of you comes back to Fate's Warning. We, we talked about that. One of my favorite bands in the 80s. Uh, 35, 36 years later, you're still growing strong, bro. My first question to you is, 64-year-old Mark Zonda still kicking ass, bro, and taking names and, and, and creating great progressive metal. Where does this all come into play with this project and everything going on with you? Well, the steroids and the doping that I got left from Lance Armstrong <laughs> it's paying off. No. Um, I've always, you know, this is just kind of what I've done since I was seven. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, that same feeling, you know, every time I walk into the studio, every time I think about it, I'm still sitting in the middle of the night working out patterns in my head and with my hands while I'm sleeping. It, it just kind of is what it is. Um, and again, you know, as you know, the more and more you learn and go, the more you realize what you don't know. And how it, the door keeps opening wider. It doesn't get smaller. It gets wider because the possibilities are infinite. So it's just a matter of um, I, I just love to do it. You know, this one was a little. I mean, this is kind of the same thing I tried to do in 2007 with Slavier, where you know, take the bull by the horns and just kind of do it. I mean, obviously, Deep Purple's not calling, Marillion's not calling. So if I want to do something, I kind of got to do it myself. And that's what this really came down to. It's like, you got to do it, put your money where your mouth is and go for it or, or basically shut up one or the other. Do you find that Mark Zonder, you work best when it's your own project? It all depends. Um, if you're saying these guys hire me, and please, anybody, don't take offense to this, but I'm not really into it. I, I it, it's not very good. But you know, everybody's got to make a living. Yeah, uh, that's one thing. You know, playing in a band situation where someone else is running the show that you totally dig and that you're into, that's great. That's that's no that's that's great too. But when you're doing something that you're in control of it, uh, obviously there's a lot more pressure. There's a lot more things that you have to learn on how dealing with different people. And um, you know, I, I've kind of. Not that I've learned so much through this process, but kind of just kind of re-emphasize different things to, you know, re-affirm uh, things. Uh, again, you know, it's all about hard work. Um, just because you work at 110%, unfortunately, you can't expect everybody else to. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a money issue. It's just a personality. You know, that's why there's Kobe Bryant. And that's why there's Devin George or whoever. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying there's, yeah. there's certain mentalities that, you know... Um, that come into play and it's music, sports, life in general. And it's one thing when you're in a band and someone else is running the show, let's say, and you just do your thing. You, okay, I'm playing the drums. I'm doing my drum stuff. I'm giving it 120%. But when you got to run the whole thing, you know, everything from picking up the towels to figuring out the artwork to the sequencing, to who's going to mix it, who's going to master it. You know, how, how are you going to pay these guys, even though you're not getting paid to make sure that they feel like it's worth it to them. Um, you know, because this wasn't an established band by any means. Right. So it's not like I asked someone to join a massive band and then it's a different story. So everybody had to kind of take, you know, put in their time a little bit uh, without, you know, everybody's looking to get paid, obviously. But um, yeah, it's it, it was, it's a trying process and it's still ongoing because now you're at that point where, okay, yeah, 
to everybody out there. It looks like it's great, and blah, 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 and like you said, the press, and this, and that, and the other. But still, you got the daily grind with the label. It's like, okay, now what are we doing? This is really cool, but I'm thinking three months from now. I'm thinking two months from now. I'm not thinking to sit here and, and have a drink and go, wow, that was really cool. You know? It's... It's just, it just, it's ongoing. That's kind of what I'm doing every day, whether it's playing the drums and writing new material or planning out what we're doing and trying to do, you know, a video for every song. How are we going to pull that off financially? Um, so, yeah, it's just business. You know, it really turns into a business at that point. I use the word autonomy, full autonomy in everything we do. I like to have that sometimes in life. And I think you're the same way in many ways. You, uh, not that we're control freaks, but this is your baby, uh, your project. Is having full autonomy, uh, is it good and could it be too much at times? Well, it's not the, that kind of uh, what you're talking about. I'm not looking at the bass player going, okay, play E, play D, play C. That's not it. My whole philosophy from the beginning was find the best people that you can find and let them do what they're going to do. OK, right. someone has to drive the bus. Someone has to get the record deal. Someone has to find the singer. You know, all those little things. You can't have like five guys like ants just running around trying to do things. It just doesn't work. Right. You know, that, that, that's like mixing by committee. That just doesn't work. Um, so, no, it was just a matter of letting them do what they want to do. Very, very little when it came to the music. It was like, hey, man, I, I think four times is, is enough. We don't need to go eight. Hey, how about this idea? When it comes to musical, we're just throwing music around. So that was fine. Um, but there is just kind of a pressure because not that everybody expects something, but there are decisions to be made, you know, uh, like the album cover. You know, I had 10 guys send stuff in and we weren't doing the Vikings cut the heads off and wandering through the desert and a really dark album cover and all that crap. We weren't doing that. So I just called Hugh Syme, who I've known for years, who, you know, has a resume, you know, about as long as it gets. Um, and wanted to work with him, and it just kind of rolled out. And, you know, the album cover, is it standard for everybody? No, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to jump. It's supposed to be different. It's supposed to draw attention, you know? Again, you find the best people that you can find and let them do what they do. You know, the same thing when it came down to mixing and, and mastering with Simone. It was like, yeah, we went back and forth a few times. Hey, can you change this a little bit? But he knew where we were going. He got it. You know, um, so you just find those people that you that that work, you know, and just let them do what they do. I wasn't sitting here critiquing and, well, you know, uh, you know, you know, but there's certain business aspects and certain things about running a band. You're not going to sit there with five guys and sequence a record. You know, <laughs> everybody's going to yeah, have a yeah. completely different thing. And these are the things technically at the end of the day that really don't matter. I mean, they don't really matter. I've never heard anybody say, hey, man, I really loved your record, man, but that's sequencing. I don't know about that. You know, yeah, sometimes yeah. fans get so over overblown into looking into the littlest things that at the end of the day, like I said to my kids, and I usually say it in an English accent, but I'm not going to do that now, but does it really matter? Does it really matter? Right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Take me into the writing process, because I, I, I love the album. Probably got to pick a favorite song. I, I like Stranded a lot. I, I just think it's 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 a it's a different kind of groove. I, I really like it. Um, but there's different sounds on here, um, a lot of different time changes. How does one like yourself, a world class drummer and musician and writer, how do we start this process on this album? W where does it come from? And are you happy with how everything came into fruition? Oh, absolutely. Um this was kind of done the same thing with, you know, my band Slager. I sit around and just record grooves, some crazy, some kind of crazy, some simple, whatever the case may be, you know, always lock into a tempo. And that's how they start. I sent different ideas, you know, rise again, that whole yeah. thing that I'm playing on the electronic kit with, with the pads and the acoustic kit. That was the first song that we ever wrote. And that was based on that whole intro groove. Because again, as a drummer, you know, it's a lot easier for people to write to kind of a, it's not crazy because the groove is right there, but it, it sounds crazy. Um, then me trying to jam that into someone else's song. So you start you start writing like that. Okay, we have the tempo. Okay, it's 104. Okay. Well, I, I hear this going to another part. I hear it more of like a halftime power belt. So I would send out different 
other grooves to create. And and Viv, the keyboard player who I was basically writing most of the stuff with, would come back with his own stuff, with his own part, but it would be in tempo, and then I'd create a drum part, and it just went from there. It, it, it's exciting just you telling us that and, 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 and imagining, you know, when writing these grooves, even this level of your of your life and everything you've done up to this career, are you sitting there as Mark Zonder, or do you ever do this and say, you know what, I got this little halftime. Let me play it like so-and-so, and so-and-so, so-and-so. Because there's nothing wrong with that. We, we've all borrowed stuff from others. Yeah. Is that ever coming to your play, or you just really want to focus on creating your own stuff? You know, I'm going to probably curse myself here, but it's been a very long time that I sat down at the drum kit and went, man, I'm bored and I don't know what to do. I mean, this morning, I, this morning I sit down and I'm playing this kind of, kind of simple riff. It's got kind of that jumpy kick pattern and it's got an offbeat right hand and that's all cool. But then I start moving that off hand between the bell and the closed hat over here. Okay. You know, and then yeah. bring in the bell of the cymbal. So it's, a, it's, it's never ending and, and, and no, it just, it just keeps going and keeps going. I, on this record, it was like I pulled out everything. I've got the electronics. The beginning is stranded. Yeah. I actually play on the little Yamaha kit over here. I made a little stereo file. There you go. Yeah. Live, I'll be able to play it. No problem. I'll use my D, you know, DTX pad, and I'll be able to play all this live. But I really wanted to bring the electronics in. Um, that's something that I've always done, and not a lot of guys really do it in this kind of music and do it where they're playing it with the kit. I'm not talking about just getting up and turning around playing electronic kit. That's a right. different story. Yeah. But no, everything. I mean, even, I don't even know what the hell it's called, but the beginning of Far Side of the Horizon is that thing that Remo used to make. It has a big tube and this long ass wire that comes out the bottom and you hit the wire and it makes that sound. I'm like, okay, we're, I'm going to use that too. Another thing, I don't know if you really saw, but I got heavy into the percussion. It was, you know, I was over done tambourines, shakers, um, Kabasa, uh, I was just, I was looking for the groove because, if, you know, I kind of reference back when you listen to Toto, as, as great as Picaro was, obviously, he always had a, a percussion guy there, you yeah. know, and that percussion guy just kind of put that little, little edge on it and it just really made a groove. So I kind of stole on that, that one from there and just tried to make it groove as much as possible. Yeah. I love your connection, the marriage uh, and I even told you this maybe offline, off camera. Uh, your 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 patterns with the hi hat and ride together. It 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 it's so beautiful. Uh, talk to me about stuff like that. Uh, about about the thought process, getting deep into those kind of parts. Um, I forgot what song it was. Maybe it it, it was the main hit. Uh, you're doing the the hi hat and ride uh, back and forth. What's the single? Uh, I'm sorry again. Are you talking about Trial by Fire? Is it I, I in that? Think, I, I don't think it's in that. I, I do play that a couple of times. I know I know what you're talking about. F all that really is is all about the groove. Because, I mean, I do. I used to do a thing in my clinic, and I'd play, like, the, the straight rock groove from Living After Midnight. You know, just yeah. boom, ka, boom, boom, ba, boom, ka. And I'd be playing the hi-hat on, on one, two, three, and four. But then all of a sudden, I'd say, hey, check this out. And I'd slip it to the offbeat. And all of a sudden, the hi-hat's playing the and, and all of a sudden, you're like, you're not in Tower of Power land, but right. you're in kind of like funk land. But it's, yes. the same, it's the same damn thing. So I use that same philosophy with my hands going all over. I was taught um, by a couple teachers, you know, that I, that I study with, especially a couple guys with the Afro-Cuban stuff. And um, actually, uh, a gentleman named Craig Yamick, who was like a, basically a Dave Garibaldi disciple. And, and I went through Dave's book stuff, but just learning the independence. Just learning and never being afraid to try stuff. There's so many, if, okay, there's 11 songs on that record, but believe me, there's like 22 different song variants that never made it in the respect of, let's try it this way. No, let's push it that way. I'm not that guy. And that's why people ask about soloing. I'm not really the big solo guy. It's like, yeah. I try to get what I do into the songs and I spend hours refining and, and listening back and going, eh, it's a little too cluttered. Give it a little bit more air and like really break it down. I sit and go, okay, how is this going to sound in front of speakers? You know, why would I hit two crashes on that side when I can hit one there, hit one here, and then come back to the floor tom? So it's like a total process. It really just comes down to, I think, when, number one, you're into it. Number two, you just spend the time. It's really about the hours to develop things. 
you know, can I play double kick at 220 beats per minute? Probably not. I'd probably stroke out, but do I want to? Do I need to? Right, right. You know, I'm looking at, you know, using what I have and incorporating and taking it as far as I can take it. Yeah, and guys, we're talking to the tremendous Mark Zonda, always so kind to me over the years, and I appreciate his time. I love the mix of this and the sound, and I think I spoke to you about it, how another song, uh, it's panned left and right, how it's done it's so beautifully. Um, I forgot what song that was again. It's a, it's a, I apologize. It was panned burf, a perfect, and but it was percussion stuff. That's the stuff that... I know for me as drummers, after playing 40 years, I can appreciate more. Hmm. Do, you, do you find that musicians uh, 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 around you can always be truthful? And do you always want them to be truthful? You know, I always wanted to quote, okay, be truthful. You, okay, that's the way they feel. Right. Okay. Is it truthful to me? You know? I mean, I could tell you stories about certain things on that record where someone might have said, hey, man, uh, do you think you can maybe play a straight beat there? You know, kind of thing. Right. And I kind of went, no. Um, um, you know, if that's the case, we can just bust out the drum machine. Right. Uh, there's plenty of, it, it's about the dynamics, man. I, You know, you want to be truthful? I mean, but that's kind of your opinion. You right, know? right. Uh, I, right. I don't know. That's that's you know that's why you kind of do at this point in the game. I wanted to do what I wanted to do because I didn't want to have, you know. I mean, here's an interesting, exact point for that. When Jim Matheos and John Arch asked me to play on a couple songs on the Arch Matheos record, of course, I was like, yeah, great, cool, okay. So they have an intro to one song, and it's very mellow. And it's very you know it's kind of mellow. And I sit down and I do my electronic thing to like no end. And I'm thinking, okay, even if they don't like it, I, I'm coming up with something totally happening. This will show up somewhere, trust me. And worked it all out, and it was great, and it was cool. And Jim was just like, nah, nah, I kind of hear it just, man, can you just play the, the ride on the quarter beat, you know, kind of thing. And that's cool. It's his thing, right. so he gets to call the shots. That's what music, you know, is all about. There's no right or wrong, you know, uh, but that's the way he heard it. So by the same token... No, I don't really hear it with a straight four where everybody's going to kind of fall asleep and, you know, you know, it, it's no, this is kind of like what I do. And, you know, and, and, and it's interesting, too, is because I've done things in the past and recorded for people and I've played it kind of straight up because that's what they wanted. And people are like, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? Why aren't you playing like you? I go, oh, oh, so you didn't want the straight stuff. So, no, I just. At this point in the game, unless someone, uh, you know, again, if anybody takes offense to it, I apologize in advance. Unless you're going to pay me a whole bunch of money, at this point in the game, I want to do what I want to do. You know, the clock's ticking. We yeah. only have so much time. Yeah. I, you know, I don't need to establish my career. Um, but believe me, if Richie Blackmore called me and said, hey, play Boom Tap, I'd be playing Boom Tap all night long. <laughs> but in a situation where it's not, why... I'd rather do what I do, you know? Right. Do what you do. My whole point there is because I've just had this whole very honest opinion for a long time now, and really hard to offend me. It really is. 11 songs on the album. If I said to you, Mark, I love nine of them, I don't like two. Let me go. It doesn't mean anything. Somebody else might like those two. It's just an opinion, like you know, at, you know what I'm saying. So I, I think we should always allow people just to be as honest as we can. I didn't offend you by saying uh, those two songs are bad. Just I didn't like my favorite band of all time. I told you is Queensrÿche. I never liked all their stuff. They're still my favorite band. No, I, I, I mean, yeah, I can appreciate that. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I'll be honest. Another thing I learned on this record, as much as I think it's great and everything's great, you know, I've heard the, I've heard the what I would consider goofy comments but hey you know if, if you don't like it that's why there's 31 flavors at paskin robbins right, it's like right, right. you know if, if you sit down and i know people have tried it and you've seen them in the media where every single person in the world needs to like me you know they they and, and if you don't like me i'm going to argue with you and i'm going to badmouth you and i'm going to try to prove my point i mean seriously you know i know what it is you know yeah i've heard people at the album cover well you know the the, the zebra's teeth are really gross. I go, well, maybe we'll send them to the dentist for the next part. <laughs> it's like, sometimes it's, it's hard, though, because sometimes you think to yourself, well, wait a minute. Yeah. You know? 
But that's the way people think, you know, let's face it. Think about people over the last 30, 50 years. I mean, you know, people think all kinds of different shit. You know, you're going to tell me, sorry if I swore, sorry. No, me. you're good, uh, you're good. Uh, you know, you're going to tell me our logo looks like a swastika? You know, and then, and then the funny part is when the guy comments, well, maybe the black guy in the band uh, is taking offense. And I wrote back, well, maybe the Jewish guy, you know, isn't taking offense because it doesn't look like a swast. <laughs> what do you do with that? Right, you, right, you right, right. I mean, what do you do? I, I don't know. You know, everybody doesn't think the same. I get it. Hey, the record wasn't meant to be a prog record. We came out from the very beginning and stated very emphatically what we're trying to do. OK, so I love a, I love when in a review, well, this isn't a prog record, you know, and. And then they go on to make that a, a, a negative point about the record. But wait a minute, where you know, you went to a taco bar and you're pissed, you know, that you're not getting a corned beef sandwich. Right, 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 right. You know, I so get it. It's been interesting. You know, it seems like 99% of the people and the press get it. They get exactly what we're trying to do. Kind of a feel good, up tempo, up thing, transfers, you know, to the to a bigger place, to a, a crowd that's together. You know, it's not like the small little club thing where everybody's going, you know, that kind of stuff. So th they get it as far as that goes. You know, they get it. Talk to me about the whole cast of characters on this album and uh, how all of them came into play. Well, it's really interesting is you're talking with about five people. You're talking about two of them I've never met in my life. They've never met me. Um, obviously, you know, I know Ray. Uh, you know, Philip is probably one of the few people in, in the world that I leave my kids, my car keys, you know, and my wallet with without even thinking twice about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, you know, starting off with Viv, you know, when we first hooked up, because I actually talked to Matt Guillory, uh, the keyboard player, and he said he was too, you know, he was too busy, which in this day and age is code for you're not paying enough. So I get it. You know, that, that's cool. I get it. Um, so I talked to Viv and he told me all about how he's in high school. He's listening to my records and, you know, basically his dad's my age. Okay, great. Cool. Whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're good. Um, and then we just musically, it, it wasn't a lot of talking. It was just sending files back and forth, you know, and that's where the real magic happened. He had worked with Juke, the guitar player for 20 some odd years. So that was almost like him bringing Juke in was like me bringing Philip in. It was like a no brainer. Right. right. But even more importantly, is the first time when I heard Juke play to our stuff, I just said, oh my God. You know, this is like, this is perfect. This is like, I couldn't have imagined anything better. You know, musically, it all falls together. It's just a very, very strange deal when you're talking about guys you never met. So they don't know your personality. You and, me, you and I, after all these years, have kind of got each other's personality and we're good, even though we've never met per se. Right, right. We, you kind of get it. You just get it. Um, some of the other guys, I don't think at times, like, quote, get me. They, they don't. Everybody, like I said in the beginning, not everybody's running at 110% all the time, no stop. You know, I'm going to go shoot my, you know, thousand jump shots in the gym kind of thing. And like, just go, 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 go. Everybody has their own little things that you have to kind of deal with. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it, it worked out. You know, everybody's now, everybody's off doing their solo record, supposedly. Ray's doing another solo record. I guess Jupe's doing some kind of self-produced one. Viv has one coming out on Frontiers. It's it's this day and it's just this the way it is in the music business now, you know. I love the bass. Uh, I'm sorry. I love the bass sound on this uh, album. I'm trying to think what it reminds me of. It, it it's just it was, it was done right over there. It was done right there. Oh. That Summit preamp right there. <laughs> it's a great it's a great sound, man. And and uh, I thought it was mixed so so perfectly at times. Uh, I, I I mean the connection and then. I mean, Ray's voice. I mean, what what do you say about Ray's voice? I think it it was a perfect compliment for everything that you did, and uh, I'm a big fan of it. I, that's you know, some of stuff I grew up with. You know, the Queens Reich stuff and uh, bands like um, Crimson Glory. You know, going back to that kind of stuff. Uh, this this whole you know you know Fate's Warning sound. But what now? You know, like, like you said before, the album is great. Uh, What's the 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 main recipe, you know, for the future of, of this project? Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because I have no <laughs> freaking idea whatsoever. Um, 
that's kind of a tough one, you know, because this day and age, I mean, we're looking into the live thing. That's difficult because you have all the bands from 21 that were blown out are playing now. So we're kind of looking toward next year. Uh, then you've got, you know, we're with a great label, but we're not with Atlantic Records. And right, this isn't right. Bon Jovi. So there's only, quote, so much. I mean, we've uh, figured out a way to basically do a lot of videos uh, at a very cheap price to... Because it seems like everybody's listening to music with their eyes. So you have to give them something to listen to or to, to look at while you're listening. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're kind of going round and round with the label now. They want to put one out once every month. And I'm thinking I, I'd rather do it every two weeks, you know. But they're saying, well, you know, you have to let them breathe and stuff. And I'm like, but what else are we doing in the meantime? Because you know how that out of sight, out of mind, you know, now residing in the where are they now file. You know, right, it's right. like. It's like, so we're just trying to do as much as we can do, you know, interviews with you, with anybody else. I mean, just constantly banging it. We have the merch store, you know, we're constantly adding things and adding like, now there's going to be a thing in about a week where if you buy three items, you get a free autographed drumstick. And this, these are the ones that I use. These aren't like, Hey guys, I uh, put my name on a stick and send it out. You know what I mean? It's, it's not one of those. They're all beat to crap. You know, I save them. Don't ask me why. Uh, I don't go through them very often, so there's not that many. But I took them and I signed them and sent them off to the merch company, and it'll be part of the thing. Nice. Just anything and everything that we can do, constantly posting. You know, I have my people out there when we have something, I get it to them, just go post. You know, our big thing, and no one seems to crack it, and it's the age old thing. How do we get out of the Fates Warning, Armored Saint, Lizzie Borden, Metal Blade thing? How do we get out of that? You know, and there, there's comments, and, and I made them myself. Hey, yeah, you know, I'll call Phil up, and we'll go up and for Kansas, Foreigner, Journey, whatever. I got, but realistically, I mean, it'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. Would we sell any units? Probably not. Probably not. I don't, you know, I don't see Kansas, you know, put it this way. If Kansas and all these bands put out new records, and they're not selling half a million and a million, you can just tell how the record buying public is, okay? So it's, it's a tough gig. But if we were to open up for other people, that might be to a younger gen demographic, might be a different story. But how do you get in front of it? How do you open up for Greta Van Fleet? You know, um, how do you play for bands that are, are younger that think that they're the the you know the new face of rock? Because again, you can just sit here all day long and just puddle around and puddle around. But how do you jump out? You know, I'm not sure if it can. You know, I'm not sure. Yes, and you said something for before, brother. I've been saying this for years. It's a brilliant statement by you. What a great job. We listen to music with our eyes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got goosebumps, and I'm going to tell you why. We are a I do it. I don't know if you do it, and I've been guilty of this. We want to watch a video. If Joe Gansis is playing a beat, and it's really good, and I love Steve Gadd, if Steve Gadd's playing the same beat, a thousand likes for Steve Gadd and none for me. I get it. But let's take the video out of it. I wonder how we would be if they just heard those two beats and said, wow, that first one sounds better. Oh, it's Joe Gansis. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, Steve Gadd. You know what I'm saying? So we, 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 we're not always truthful oh, because, yeah. because, and I, I'm not mad at Steve Gadd or anybody, but we, we do that a lot. We see who, oh, that's a great song. Who is it? Well, what do you have to see? I want to see, oh, it's Steve Gadd. It, it has to be better than Mark's or Joe's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, that was actually part of the reason that when I started this, the idea was going old school with the artwork and the album cover. I didn't want to do the, hey, go to our website and check out the pictures. I wanted to see and have people experience with the vinyl. I mean, you can do a CD too, but with vinyl where you sit there, like the old days, you're listening to that record. And you're looking at that zebra, and then you're flipping it over, and you're seeing all the artwork that yeah, he signed yeah, did yeah. to go that way. It was a complete old school kind of thing instead of this modern art. And hey, go to our website, and you know that kind of thing. And I understand why bands do that. It's all economics, man. It's all money. That's all it is. And it's just it, it's tough, you know. Um, it, it's very tough. So, but with all this, the social media and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just think it's important to pe just keep popping those songs out there, you know, um, keep keep that music in front of them. Unless the label's got a better idea, which I know they're working how they work and they do their thing. 
but it, you know it's tough and it's and it's frustrating you know it's frustrating you know i mean you can see you know it, like most bands you know an album has pre-orders and it comes out and you have kind of a spike in sales and then the age-old question what now you know so is uh do, do you have management with you guys is it all you like how would you go about uh, finding a band that you want to open up for how does it work today in uh you know with with the mark zonder who's been doing it for a while you still got to do all, all the nitty-gritty stuff or you make one phone call take me into that process uh, it, it's just all about money money all those, a lot of those opening acts are all about a buy-on or the fact that you can do it but we're not paying you or the pay is so small that you're going to have to come in with money from your you know from your own side and you know and and a lot of labels most labels these days aren't going to put up because they're looking at okay we're going to put this band on a tour well is it going to relate to record sales or is it just going to kind of build the band and, and build the buzz of the band now one would like to think that building the buzz of the band would have something to do with future sales but that's not necessarily all all true and it is it is a different thing you know, I mean, I remember very distinctly, you know, very back, very back, back in the day with, uh, with Fate's Warning, you know, you do a record and the record wasn't even done and they would have the tour dates basically lined up to use that in combination. But th that just doesn't happen anymore unless you're a major, major band. Let, let's face it. You know, if you're a big band, you can kind of do whatever you want because the draws are. And I was thinking that when this came out, hopefully there was a possibility that it would kind of catch fire and kind of move this band to the head of the line a little bit. As far as oh yeah, we want we want you guys to play, you know we want we we'll book this, you know because we know people are going to come, blah 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 blah. It it it's so good, brother. It's so good, and and I I, I never I never bullshit anybody. I would tell you, it is so good, man. The sound, ah, uh, I mean I, I'm I I'm gonna bring this up because uh, I could see you on with, uh, on a tour with Queensrÿche. Why not? I, I yeah, think it no. make. Makes so much sense. Oh, that kind of band. <laughs> Absolutely. I already talked to um, Giles, who helps me run this and manage it, and you know, talking to the agents and stuff. And I said, you know, I listed out bands that would be perfect. You know, that there's an audience there that you would think off the top of your head would already know the band, but not necessarily. But not necessarily. So to go out, I also think there's a point that you need to go out and prove, you know, that you can do it. That you. You can tear it up, and, and that, and I definitely think this is a band and a record that will be more powerful live than the actual record itself. Great point, brother. Is that frustrating to you? I got to bring it up again after all these years, or it's part of the territory. It, it's not what you did yesterday; it's what you can do tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, is it frustrating? You have to actually prove. I'm Mark Zonda. I've done a lot, but have I? No, it's it. I don't expect anything. Right. I just want to be judged on what it is. Yeah. And the fact that do I have twenty five years to build a following right now? I, I don't know about that. I'd like to think so. I tell my kids I'm going to be here till a hundred because yeah. I'm going to mock them when they have kids. But um, no, I I just want to be put it this way. If I turned out a record, you know, and, and and it was all fusioned up and jazzed up and everything like that, and as much as it was amazing, I, I get it. You know, you're going to be playing in a place with 12 people. I get it. But this one was designed, and it was overly thought out from the get-go, not to miss a thing. I sat down and said, okay, what are all the things that have kicked you in the balls over the years? Okay, forget the odd time. Forget all the intricate playing. You know, critical acclaim is overrated. We've done that. They know we can do it. We're trying to get out of that. We're not trying to leave it behind. We're going to take it with us. But we're trying to get out of that and get to a different audience. And, you know, I, I've heard it several times that, you know, this fits right in with that commercial hard rock, whatever you want to say. I mean, this band could play, uh, you know, anything from like Journey to Queensryche, you know, and, and anything in between, you know. Yeah. Um, it is frustrating in the respect of that you want to sit here and you see, if I was sitting on the couch eating bonbon, watching soap operas all day, I'd have nothing to complain about and believe me i don't have anything to complain about i'm not right. complaining right i just want to work my ass off to get it to where i can get it the frustrating part is kind of like not knowing what to do if you say hey uh mark go in with viv and write a song okay no problem no problem we can do that you know hey call Hugh and get him going on another album cover great no problem you know call chris grosso tell him we're going to be banging out the videos no problem but when you get to the point now where you've got this baby what do you do with it you know, like Giles and I always said, the last thing we want to be doing is two months from now, 
having a conversation with the label going, okay, um, uh, what are we going to do now? Yeah, yeah. I was just hoping and thinking, a little praying maybe, um, that it would catch. You know, it would like, you know, again, you know, funny story, and you tell me. You know, people joke, and like when I when I see, you see it in the articles all the time, you know, beer com commercials, car commercials, and Cobra Kai, okay? Now picture this. Cobra Kai, Johnny wakes up in the morning, totally drunk, goes over, gets a half thing of Coors, crushes it and downs it, goes down his shirt, typical stuff, grabs his keys, goes outside in his car, puts the sunglasses on, starts the motor up, and right as he about to shift, trial by fire comes on. I don't know. Seems like gold to me. Let's let's make it happen. I mean, <laughs> we've tried. You know, we've tried. You know, it's it's hard. You know, it's uh, you know, and I'm not complaining by any means. And there's dudes out there that songwriters and composers for years and years and years are just banging on doors trying to get things happen. You know, and so it, it's just a tough business, period. And it's gotten a lot tougher over the years. But you know, again, I think the philosophy really just comes down to at the end of the day. You do everything that you possibly do that you can control and certain things that you can't control, you kind of got to let them go because you can't control them. You can't, you can work and you can make the phone calls and you can be a pain in everybody's ass. Yeah. You no. Know? And that's, that's what I am, but that's the only way things get done. You know, it's funny because a couple of the guys in the band said, well, Mark, you know, you got to relax and you know, everything will get taken care of. And I said, well, you know, if I relax, we'd have three songs and no singer right now. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Different mentalities get you to different places. You know, maybe this is what this, you know, it's, it's nothing different for me. It's just me. who uh, I've always been the same. So maybe this is where it goes. Maybe this is, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the top of the mountaintop. All I know is, is, you know, that record to me is the best thing that I ever did. No question about it. Best sounding record I've ever done by miles. I mean, miles. Um, I listened to that and I've I've heard it 120 times. Okay, there's like three things I could tell you right now. Hey, could you tweak that? Could you tweak that? Could you? Tweak? It just kicks my ass every time. I, I actually sit there sometimes and just go. I'm waiting for it to disappoint me. You know what I mean? I'm waiting for it to go. Oh yeah, it's maybe not that good. Right, right. You know? Talk to me about that. It's a great point. So you made this album. It's the best thing you ever done. Are you okay if it just gets put on a shelf? Think, think about that. Are you okay with it? It's still the best thing you've ever done. Let's say you just never play out and you don't do anything with it. Are you still okay with it being the best thing you've ever done? Oh, absolutely. Um, I look at it this way. There's millions. Well, I don't know about millions. There's a lot of records that shoulda, coulda, woulda. Okay? You know, for whatever reason, didn't. Um, I knew this business getting into it. I've yeah. known it for a lot of years. It, it is what it is. You know, yeah. I, mean, I can't be disappointed. What, what am I going to do? Cry? What am I going to do? Complain? What am I going to do? Uh, you know, I just do what I'm doing. You know, we're writing new material, which is, is the part that I really love and just being creative. And I, I, I don't have a choice, Joe, to answer your question. Yeah. I don't have a choice. Right, right, right. Do I have a choice? No. <laughs> it is what it is. Did you give 110%? You know? Yeah. You know, not everybody wins a championship. You know, and you know, but then again, you have to ask yourself, what is the championship? I'm 64 years old and I'm producing and cranking out records. Yeah. There's a lot worse things going yeah. on, man. Yeah, sure. There's a lot worse, you know. My kids are healthy, you know. I mean, what am I, you know, no, I, I can't complain. I got to just keep pushing. I got to keep pushing. Plus, the, the Dodgers are kicking ass. There you go. Yeah, but that's scary. I mean, I love the Dodgers, but it's it's scary at times. It, how how good they are, but at the same time, sometimes you just see it. I don't want to say fall apart, but kind of like I don't know. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know. You know, I, yeah. the, the pitching the, the pitching everybody gets hurt. You yeah. know, it's crazy. But you gotta admit, man, uh, who is it? Um, it's not Theo Epstein. It's um, Andrew Freeman. Man, <laughs> yeah. how he pull, how he can pull that off? Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, yeah. Trey Turner. I, I mean, know some guys. Yeah. And plus all the homegrown dudes that they have. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, you know. It's I don't know, but again, again, this is all cute and this is fine. But let's get to the playoffs. I just saw a thing the other day on the Buffalo Bills. So, you know, let's you know, 
Well, let's see. That's th- that's my team in football, the Bills. Uh, I have been through heartache. We lost four in a row. That's my favorite team. I, they're all picking us to win this year, but uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not buying it. Tonight, my Rams. Tonight, we'll see. Oh we'll my. See. Oh boy. I yeah. I, uh, I want to talk about the business. We talked about the business a lot in this con- in interview, and I, I thank you for this time, brother. Um, are you okay? Because I think you're in tune with the business. Are you okay with the business? Always being a business. I don't have a choice. You know, I, I don't have a choice. I, it's, I look at it this way, and I know a lot of people bitch and complain. I always looked at life as there's certain rules, and they're not suggestions. They're rules. Yeah, yeah. And you learn them, and you understand them, and then you learn how to play within that context and play the game, as long as it's within the context. That's why people crack me up when, they always say about, wow, oh, you know, this guy, you know, he went bankrupt and whatever. Bankruptcy is a business strategy. It's legal. Okay. You know, it's like I always used to say, you know, the idea is to have an accountant who's always learning the law and he's smart and knows what he's doing. It's about being informed and, and how to play this game. I mean, it's been a complete education with all the Facebook stuff and the social media and all this and all that. And I still don't think anybody really knows. I think it's a complete crapshoot. You know, uh-huh. I'm sure Alice Cooper doesn't have a problem. You know, the, you know, he, he's established. It's just, it's just kind of an interesting game. But no, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, you can only do what you can do. You know, uh, you just kind of keep, you got to keep pushing. And when the day comes, if you're not into it or whatever the case may be, you know, you move on. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about y- your playing, and it's always so tasteful. I'm a huge fan. Talk to me about traditional grip because we don't see it a lot in this genre. Let, 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 let's be honest. We don't see it a lot e- even sometimes in the, in the metal world. You got guys like Todd Zuckerman, yourself, Steve Smith, who have that power, who have that luxury and can just play it. This whole album, was the whole 11 songs played traditional? Do we go to match grip? Because I think that's pretty cool to talk about that. Do we ever switch while we're doing that, You know, even in the studio? Yeah, um, because if I'm doing something over here with the snare, right. the second snare, and I'm turning this way, I've tried it playing it traditional, but it's weird. It's just weird. So you go to match grip, and if I'm, especially if I'm playing like the pad, right. the yeah, the DTX-12 is sitting there. So, no, I, I, I slip it around a little bit when I have to. Um, you know, sometimes coming out of parts, uh, sometimes, you know, um, a cowbell part where the cowbell's on the left hand side because of the angle, the way it's sitting, it's it's more you know the stick is going to be here. It's going to be a little more difficult. Again, just tools in the toolbox. Use them when you can. Yeah. And just do the best that you can with it. And it just gives me the I won't say luxury, but luxury to do use what's what when I need to use it to get done across creatively what I want. Do you find that for you personally, uh, if you need a song that's a little more powerful? You might switch to 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 match grip or something else. No, my my left hand traditional grip is probably stronger. Beautiful. Um, in a straight backbeat sense, and also in a thirty second note nice. kind of situation. Um, now I, I've learned and kind of mastered that one. Yeah. As far as where it sits and the rim, that's why you see I don't break sticks; they wear out in the rim because um, it's all about that left hand being in there with the backbeat. And plus, you hold traditional you hold it towards the butt end more yeah because you get you get a i get a little bit more power that way um there's just a certain balancing thing i think every drummer has it on their own accord of where it feels right and where it feels wrong it it, you don't sit down and go okay quarter of an inch this way you just kind of put it in your hand and start playing and it kind of naturally makes its way to that sweet spot i very very much uh equate this to you know whether it's baseball when you just pick up that ball and just casually throw it or, or you just pick up the bat and it's just that casual swing. It just feels good. You know, it's like when you walk on the court and those first couple dribbles off the go, you know, kind of thing. It's that feel. Yes. And I've talked about this uh, and I've always equated the same thing you did playing baseball. Do you find that if you want a little more speed, you might choke up like a battle would? No, no, I, I, I'm in the, I, it never moves. It okay. Never, it never moves. I, nice. No, I just, I've never done that. I, I, I've heard about that, you know, and I've seen different things, but 
to be honest with you, probably if it gets to a point like that, I'll figure out another riff to play, you know, or I'll, yeah, I'll figure yeah. out a way how I can introduce it. I spend a lot of time, and I'm sure a lot of other drummers do, or, or maybe they don't, but I'm really breaking stuff down when I'm playing and making things the easiest I can. And how do I get out of this fill? If I'm going to hit two kicks, well, then I got to come in this way or that way or, you know, different things like that. So sometimes I'm not so concerned about just driving a riff home. It's like, just being creative and making it flow. It's got to feel good. I don't mind doing things, and I was doing it this morning, that were awkward for the first five or ten minutes or whatever. You know, it's kind of awkward. And But then you, the more and more you play it, and you just keep playing it, and then it gets kind of in your head. Um, but I won't sit there for three days to try to play something ridiculous. You know, it's, There's no point. So the album's out. Uh, I've seen it on, on, on some charts. It was doing good. Um, what we talked about, what's next... Uh, and you're already writing stuff. Uh, so my last question is this. Um, when do you w- want to be out there by? When do you, is, is, is there a goal? Do you want to be, you want to be playing certain shows? Is, is there a, is there a time frame here? Oh, no, absolutely. Like, like yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, All right. We're, we're working it. We're talking about possibly doing something where we maybe go to a place uh, like Greece and, uh, just, you know, rehearse for two days, bang out a couple shows, just to get it on film, just to show the world, yes, it's a band, and this is what it's like and how powerful it is live. Not necessarily sit here and wait for the ultimate tour. You know, that might be something to do that would be a smart idea as far as moving this along. I just can't sit here, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and I know, yeah. and, and we've been talking, and I've been talking to people at Rock Hard and, uh, or Metal Hammer, or what I lose track of them, but, you know. And, you know, they're very familiar with Warlord and Face Warning. They did those shows. So we, we, we should be able to pull something like that together. I think it would be awesome. Even if it was small, I don't care. Small is good, to be honest. With this group of guys that we've never really even hung out together, I don't want to get thrown onto this big-ass stage right out of the box. It could be a little, you know, hey, let's, let's, let's get a couple under the belt first. You know, let's, let's do have a couple spring trainings, you know, before we, we go out in front, you know, that kind of thing. So... We're working on it. I think that's a very important next step because I think that'll create a huge buzz. Um, so we're working on that. Great, great. Mark Zonda, uh, I always appreciate your time, brother. Just tremendous stuff. We, we touched on so much here. I got one more question. And I want to talk about you at 64. And, and if, if I'm 53 now, and I hope in 11 years I, I look as good as you, brother. You're just always in shape. And, and your playing is great. Do you feel like your maturity is in the best place right now as a drummer? Not a 35-year-old or 40-year-old. Oh, no, ab- abso- absolutely. There's no question. Um, oh, no, absolutely. Uh, combination of learning a lot of things along the way. Yeah. You know, maybe to listen more. You know, maybe to listen to music in different ways. Uh, and just and just the years of playing, you know, it's not it's you know it's not. Let me rephrase that. It's not the years; it's the hours, and how much you you know you're training your body. There's no difference between that and an athlete. You know, I, I'm at that point where if I hear something in my head or I'm thinking about something, I can pretty much sit down and play, and then I'll come up with 12 different ideas that branch off of that. So I'm good there. Yeah, you know, honestly, spend time in the weight room, working out. Uh, you know, you kind of have to. I, I eat fine. I don't drink. I've never smoked. I've never drank. Um, I just try to do the best that I can because I know the health thing is everything. And, and you see them dropping like flies, whether they can't play because the hands hurt, the back's fucked up, or whatever the case may be. I mean, I was fortunate enough, you know, to learn as a kid properly. You know, knock on wood here again, I'm going to curse myself, but I've never had a problem playing, like, physically. So, you know, it's just a matter of taking care of everything. I think you really have to take care of yourself uh you know mentally and physically uh it's very important life is good life is good brother yeah. life yeah. is good. we're above ground right we're good <laughs> yeah. uh people who want to check the album out and, and you know where can they still get it uh every, every, all that stuff uh you can get it on our merch site you can get it at the, on the metal blade site as well you can get it on amazon it's pretty much all over the place you know uh it's very easy to find um, you know, especially when you're on Facebook there, you can see different places that have it. Uh, people, you know, again, Metal Blade is the best place. Just go right, you know, metalblade.com or whatever it is. You know, you, you'll be able to find it. 
Guys, the tremendous and always so good to me, Mark Zonda. I appreciate your brother so much, and I'll be in contact. Thank you once again for educating us on drums and the whole band, and we'll be in contact soon. Guys, the great Mark Zonda, man. I, I, I really appreciate you always, and you know that. Absolutely, man. I, I appreciate it. But uh, I'm not sure if my Dodgers back in the day could give them the Reds a run for the money. But that's another story. Another story for another day. But well, you know... Well, you know what? You know, real fast, I, I, I'm a realist, and the Reds were a great team, uh, but I thought they underachieved, if I'm being honest. They went to four World Series, and yeah. the, the, the A's, I'm not sure the A's were a better team, but they achieved more in the 70s than the Reds. I, I know. Well, I yeah. always say the same thing about Shaq and Kobe. Yeah. Definitely underachieved. I mean, whatever the case may be, underachieved. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I think they went whatever. God bless them both. God bless them both. They gave, they gave me a lot of great memories, man. I'm going 28-14 tonight, my Bills. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Sonder, thanks, brother. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it, man. All right, have, a great, all right, have a great day. You too. Take care. Oh, great uh -huh. stuff. Guys, tremendous stuff. Uh, I always love his thought process and uh, his honesty. Once again, we say thank you to the great Mark Sonder.